Welcome to Fiction Narratives. Chapter 201 Marvel Zombies Final, New World. Alan's POV. Today, I showed a very pathetic side of myself. Let's set aside Hank Pym's death, that's a fact, and nothing in the world will change it. It's just that I began to lose myself. If I had continued that way, I would have become a different Alan. I accept the changes, killing Galactus and Sentry won't keep me up at night. As Makama said, they were openly threats. But in the end, I was just a normal guy until all this started. In fact, compared to me, Rebecca, who despite seeming immature, has lived in a shitty city where people die every day, this makes her better than me at dealing with this whole situation, even Wednesday, being so exposed to the abnormality of her family makes her more prepared to see a world like this. Ha ha ha, so you'll let me live laughed Hank, with a look that expressed he had already planned something. Perhaps he believed that sooner or later he would escape and make everyone pay. I raised my eyebrows and gave him a reality shock. No, someone else will, I turned around and called my reliable Rebecca. Hell yeah. I wanted to do this. Hank heard a gun reloading beside him, and before he could react, Rebecca shot him, splattering his head everywhere. Equals equals equals. You're a Hera, boy I don't know how to react to this. I thought everything ended too nicely, and Alan Cunn would lock him up. Nikki, well, in the end, the guy admitted that even if he returned to normal, he would still eat people, there's no other way underscore. Percy J, still, Alan said he wouldn't follow that ruthless path, but if he ordered Rebecca to do it, isn't it the same Rick, verb technically, he only said Rebecca, and didn't do anything else. Ruby, with that logic, even Hitler would be innocent, straight face, equals equals equals. Letting him go unfortunately, I'm not that naive. Regardless of my mixed feelings about all this, that zombie had to die. I don't know why, but my instincts made me feel a lot of danger from him despite not being a very powerful zombie. After that, my first thought was to go find Artoria and help her, but as death said the fight was over. Your king. Is strong. Were the words as death sent, containing a sigh of disbelief. I won't lie, I was also surprised by Artoria's victory, even with how strong she was, her opponent was a monster. I approached Galactus's body. The system says I can use it to create fragments of destiny since he's a cosmic entity composed of energy. I thought the fragments would form from events, people, places, and important objects in history, but with the latest evolution, the system became more flexible in creating fragments. Looking at Galactus, I don't know what to say about it. From what I understand, this guy was very powerful to the point of being daunting, but his end would be to be eaten by zombies, so I couldn't see him as a very powerful variant anymore. Of course, I'm just speculating, given that this universe is a loop, I can assume that sooner or later the zombies from this universe would go to Century's world, so any god or cosmic entity like Galactus would meet their end being a zombie food. I was talking to my chat for a while until several helicopters approached. Someone familiar got out of them, from the eye patch and trench coat, I assumed he was this world's Nick Fury, helped by S.H.I.E.L.D. agents. I have to say, this Fury has more presence than the Fury of my world, and it has nothing to do with his face being Will Smith's. Equals equals equals. S.H.T., it's Will Smith. Look, in this world, he decided not to hit comedians and hit criminals ha ha ha. Gwen, don't forget that a tragedy happened in this world, have a little consideration or I'll send you on permanent vacation. Equals equals equals. Fury expressed his gratitude sincerely. I can't express my gratitude enough. Although the end of the world was inevitable given how things unfolded, Fury managed to withstand the first wave. Alan wouldn't be surprised if Fury managed to create resistance against these monsters, but ultimately, with cosmic-powered entities and his worst fears coming true, the cosmic zombie Avengers would have eaten Galactus, and from there, the world and eventually the universe would have ended. It's not necessary, I came by accident and just did what I would like someone to do for my world in case something similar happened. Fury fell silent as he looked at me, acting as the super spy he is. I'm not going to conquer your world. Thank you. If there's anything you need, I'll gladly give it to you. It's not necessary, but Fury, can you handle the rest? 
I asked this question because the hunger virus still exists in normal people. The virus seems to choose whom to infect, apparently, with no more supercarriers, it had no choice but to use normal people, and the world right now is like a Resident Evil movie. Nick shook his head, compared to facing a sweep with superheroes, this is a piece of cake. Fury didn't ask for help, I don't think he needs it, seeing the armament of the S.H.I.E.L.D. agents in this world. What awaits this world is a mystery. There are no right answers, I left Fury access to my stream, so if there's ever a super zombie he can't handle, he can call me. After that, Fury talked with Iron Man while Thor and Hulk rested, the regeneration of a god and Hulk is fast, so they were already better in no time. Artoria returned to my side, and she seemed fine. Are you okay she asked as she approached until our faces were inches apart. She examined me carefully from head to toe, then let out a sigh of relief and buried me in her chest, unfortunately, the armor prevented any pleasant feelings. I'm sorry. She apologized, but from my point of view, it was very amusing. Don't worry, and what's with all this love out of nowhere? She didn't respond, just looked at me without expression. Damn, my joke didn't work. Thor, Tony, Hulk, and I went to lunch in Japan, one of the few places that were saved from the apocalypse except for Tokyo. Then it was time for them to return to our world, the system made sure no viruses or infiltrators remained. Thor, are you sure about this I asked. Before leaving, Thor left Njolnir in an easily visible location. Thor sighed and looked at the hammer. This world is defenseless. Perhaps someone worthy will find the hammer with luck. Tony, on the other hand, gave Fury all the information he could gather from Stark Industries, as support so they could develop technology to protect themselves in case a cosmic entity decides to pay a visit unexpectedly. As for me, I went to the moon and discovered that there were many Inhumans alive. Perhaps the world wouldn't lose all its protectors, but Alan knows this will bring problems. People with superpowers can end the world, regardless of blaming it all on an external factor. Governments and people wouldn't trust heroes so easily again. Host managed to obtain 150 fragments of Galactus. Seems like our cosmic friend was much more powerful than it seemed. Well, at the moment I attacked him with both the power of white and destruction, not to mention that Galactus was taken by surprise and didn't defend himself. As for the girls, Rebecca managed to obtain technology from Reed Richards, which left me speechless. Devices to swap bodies, portals capable of crossing the universe, and a machine to inhibit mutant powers, among many other things. Rebecca admitted that even with the blueprints and information, recreating this technology would be challenging. On the other hand, I had to comfort and pamper Rebecca for a while to show her that I wasn't upset with her actions. I know that both Wednesday's position of supporting me in any situation and Rebecca's attempt to stop me are correct actions. Both express differently their way of caring for me. Artoria said she suffered some injuries, but by absorbing vitality from my body, she healed. I don't know how to feel when I'm treated like an all-you-can-eat buffet. In response, she smiled and kissed me on the forehead, sometimes, she acts very maternal. Okay, I won't dwell on that. As death surprised me by giving me an amulet that the system identified as the Eye of Agamotto and something called the Time Stone. The Eye was a powerful magical artifact, however, the system said to convert the gem into fragments or leave it in this world as it didn't work outside its own universe. What a decoration. Wednesday didn't suffer in this conflict, all the time, she acted as my bodyguard in case I lost against Sentry, she would take care of getting me out of there. It was a discreet and inglorious job, but she said she was happy that my life was in her hands. It would have touched me if she hadn't said it in such a creepy tone. In the end, I hugged her. Makama. Who would have thought that it was Makama all this time, the next doll? Yeah, I could indeed open the boxes and see the new girls, but at that moment, I decided it would be a surprise. Makama, won't reveal her thoughts and goals. She may be against me, want to manipulate me, or, on the contrary, accept the status quo for now. If she follows the previous narrative, she should arrive soon after dying. Her death was disturbing, I guess it's a fitting end for a villain of her caliber. Makama is no joke, she tries to end everything that stands in her way for her obsession with Pokita. In that sense, I can be at ease, 
like with us death, since someone else already occupies her thoughts, she won't pay much attention to me. I felt chills, is someone watching me sure, the chat was watching me, but it felt like that intense gaze you get from girls who hold you in high esteem. That gaze, it wasn't MJ who looked at me like that for the first time when I was little, I felt that gaze sometimes, though mostly from mature women and older girls. With MJ and the ghost girl, I mean rogue, and now again. I guess I should get used to it already. I don't want to know who the owner is. Equals equals equals. MJ, it seems Alan has a secret admirer. Felicia, how do you know MJ, no. Well, it's nothing. Gwen, she says from experience, that's the face Alan makes when someone looks at him and makes him uncomfortable. MJ, hey. Equals equals equals. Time's up, it's time to go. This world leaves me with a little concern, it would be a bad joke if I left it and there was another apocalypse. Sure, there's a zombie apocalypse, but with the technology in this world, it's not a problem as long as there are no super zombies. Tony, Thor, and Hulk returned to our world, I took the girls and headed to another portal. In this world, I didn't think about the fragments because of the situation, but that's my goal. I looked at this place one last time before entering the space-time storm. Minus one. As usual, the system will use fragments to prevent the storm from affecting me. Of course, using abilities is out of the question for now, as Limitless, Cursed Reliquary, and the Core of Destruction are on cooldown. Hmm, maybe I should rotate abilities, though that depends on the world, if not necessary, I'll just stick with the current ones. I hope the next world will be peaceful. Chapter 202 Harry Potter, First Wife Gwen and Arriving in the Magical World Gwen dropped her head onto Alan's desk, in front of his PC. She often came to watch Alan's live streams at his apartment because her parents still didn't know that her boyfriend traveled to different universes and fought monsters and apocalypses every week. Indeed, they haven't seen Alan without his glasses, but they're not stupid. They would recognize the guy who's been with their daughter for years, even once taking him with them to the beach, camping, and skiing. They would just have to be the densest couple if Helen and George didn't recognize him. Gwen sighed. Alan is becoming more and more popular, and it's only a matter of time before they find out. It's practically a miracle they don't know yet, although it could be because her mother doesn't watch much news, and her father is a busy man. However, Alan is too viral, there are days when he's on the news all day long. Yawn. Gwen glanced back to see the beautiful redhead woman sleeping on Alan's bed. She narrowed her eyes. The problem isn't that her parents know Alan has superpowers or is a mutant, as everyone believes. The problem is they'll know their beloved daughter is dating a womanizer. Gwen could swear her father would come to beat Alan up upon finding out, even knowing he kicked the gods' asses. She's not worried about Alan getting hurt at this point, he can tank Hulk's punches, and knowing him, he won't attack her father. The problem is if the relationship between them is ruined. Gwen sighed on the desk again, putting aside that topic. Another thing that worried her was the change Alan underwent in that zombie world. MJ fainted at the sight of Natasha zombie, Gwen being stronger, endured it out of concern for Alan. Okay, after seeing her for a moment, she realized that despite their resemblance, they were different. The Natasha from her world was shorter and more voluptuous, with short hair, and the one from that world had long hair with a more developed body. While Alan's Natasha has Russian ancestry, that world Natasha has more Germanic features. It wasn't the Natasha they knew, but that didn't change the fact that it was painful and shocking. Gwen almost collapsed at that moment but endured because, no matter how bad she felt, Alan must have felt a hundred times worse. It was a miracle he remained so calm, no, he didn't. Alan ended up being affected by everything to the point of almost becoming a ruthless avenger. Gwen was a little frustrated and jealous that whoever managed to bring him back wasn't her, not even one of Alan's closest women, it was a stranger. Makama. She may not give the impression of being a good person, but Gwen appreciates her actions, regardless of whether they get along. Gwen wasted no time and started investigating that woman. Makama is a demon, a very powerful and dangerous one, her role in her previous life was to cause pain, a lot of pain. Gwen gritted her teeth. This new knowledge made her alert, and she called Alan. 
Calls between system users are telepathic, so she could chat with Alan for a while. She expressed her unconditional support and asked to be by his side whenever possible. Alan accepted her proposal, and Gwen noticed that Alan was better at this point. On the contrary, he asked Gwen if she and MJ were okay. MJ passed out at first, but she wasn't too weak to break down because of something like that, so when she woke up a few minutes later, she supported Alan from the chat, and then fell asleep again from the stress. Gwen laughed at MJ's attitude, so she helped her relax, but she still felt a little depressed for not being the woman by Alan's side at that moment. The blonde recovered, slapped her cheeks, took her phone, and called all of Alan's women. Natasha was okay and thanked her for the call, her mind was full of Alan, and she didn't realize they were worried too. Gwen asked Natasha how she could accept everything that happened. Gwen, I'm here, I'm not dead, nor am I a zombie, I just feel sorry for that woman, but it's not me. Gwen felt her body relax, and she smiled. You're right, Aunt Nat. Natasha laughed. Both women felt better. Gwen called Felicia Hardy, who was sitting by her window. She began to reflect after seeing a woman who looked like her but more mature among the zombies. Felicia lives freely, doing as she pleases, but that living corpse makes her think about how fragile she truly is. Gold, jewels, money, everything is nice, but in the end, it's worthless. You're born with nothing, and you die without taking anything, perhaps except memories. She's aware that she lives in a very strange and unpredictable world, she could go out one day to steal and end up being bitten by a monster, or more simply, someone could put a bullet in her head. Is that okay death is something you don't think about regularly, but Felicia doesn't want to die and have her last memories be a pile of worthless gold. She grabbed the pendant Alan gave her while looking at the bustling city of New York. I want to see you. She murmured, the lonely cat. At that moment, Gwen called, and Felicia smiled. Looks like the first wife is making an effort. She wasn't lying, the call made her happy, although she would prefer to cuddle with Alan. Next to be called by Gwen was Diana. In this case, it was straightforward because, as expected, the powerful Amazon princess was okay. Her mental strength was incredible, and she was ready to go help him if necessary. Diana complained at the time that it was Tony, Thor, and Hulk and not her, but she understood, that this was a world related to them. If their positions were exchanged, she would be on the verge of losing her mind in a fit of rage after seeing acquaintances die like that. Diana showed her interest in Gwen, and the princess was surprised to hear her show strength and will. It must be said that Diana is over 300 years old, but Gwen turned 18 a few months ago, which makes her mental strength very impressive. Finally, Gwen called Megan and Emma. Despite how their relationship with Alan started, they're Alan's lovers. Gwen knows that both women aren't like her and MJ, but they're not just friends with Alan either. Alan expressed his desire to maintain a relationship with both women. Gwen, for her part, doesn't know how to deal with them, she doesn't want to be condescending or anything, but it's not easy to call a woman and say, Hi, you slept with my drunk boyfriend, but I want to get along with you. After talking to Diana, Felicia, Natasha, Megan, and Emma, Gwen leaned back in her chair while thinking about what she discussed with the girls. All the others agreed that Makama was a problem. Unlike his death, whose problem was in her convictions and extremely cruel methods, she was able to maintain a certain degree of decency and even show kindness and appreciation for her subordinates. However, for Makama, it's different, she's willing to kill every person in the world if it fulfills her objectives. Gwen woke MJ up and together they brainstormed a solution. Gwen, do you think this is okay? Alan isn't comfortable with ordering others, but this is a special case. Gwen sighed and contacted Alan, who at that moment was eating with Tony and the others. Alan fell silent upon hearing the concern of his women collectively, and then he agreed with them. He needed to impose restrictions on Makama. This was something he didn't do with the other waifus, but with the control demon, the story was different, she could do a lot of damage if he didn't stop her. Makama. The redhead woman appeared, with a slight smile on her face as if she already knew everything. At that moment, Alan gave Makama some orders to control her. This made Alan feel bad because, regardless of the kind of danger she represented, Makama helped him before, 
and he was repaying her this way. Makama, in response, approached with her hands behind her back. All right, now my interest is in you, I won't waste my time wandering around. Makama's tone was flat despite her words. Alan felt Makama's hand touch his cheek and then stroke under his eyelids. Makama. I simply found you to be a fascinating existence, and I want to learn more about this world. I don't know how to call it. Alan shook his head, understanding Makama's true intentions would be harder than making Wednesday smile. Returning to the present, Alan entered a new world, this time unrelated to Marvel or DC. Alan didn't know it, but he was about to see something incredible. Upon crossing over, Alan found himself standing on a street in the suburbs. Well it's not a black hole this is already progress, said Alan with a shrug. Host. I have good news and bad news. All right, tell me the good news. Host, we have officially exited the initial programming. We're in an unknown world, and well, we didn't die in the attempt. Oh. That's good news, I suppose. And the bad news. Host, to answer that, we need to revisit old information. Sure do you remember why you can't bring many people from another world with you? Because they would be seen as intruders, and perhaps someone would try to eliminate them. That's correct, but that's not all. Every new person in a world that shouldn't exist is a disturbance. If there are too many, they might end up bothering the world itself. I suppose we want to avoid that. That's right, you didn't have that problem because you have me by your side. No matter what universes we go to, you will never be recognized as an intruder. At most, some people might feel uncomfortable with your presence, but that's because I integrated you organically into the world, as if you had always been there. I see where this is going. But now we are out of my programming, I don't have any information from this world, I don't have enough data to achieve that. I'm afraid this puts the host in a similar position to someone you might bring along. That's troublesome. So, what do we do? go back. No, I'll see if I can figure out how to achieve this harmony. Otherwise, just try not to break too many rules of the world while we gather fragments. I see. If you're in Rome, act like a Roman. Let's see, if I go to the world of Dragon Ball, I should limit myself to using only key. If I go to the world of One Piece, I should only use powers like Haki or Devil Fruit abilities. You don't know how relieved I am to have a host who is intelligent and doesn't need everything explained by me Red Heart. Alan narrowed his eyes. It had been a long time since he heard the system speak like a maiden, and it felt strange to him. So now, Alan would be restricted to using abilities, powers, and weapons consistent with the world, otherwise risking being identified as an intruder by the world. Other system users wouldn't have this restriction, but remember, Alan is outside of the system's programming. It's as if the cooking system started acting like the star singer's system. Alan simply sighed and prepared to speak with the chat. However, in the distance, he felt a presence. Alan took cover behind a tree while on the street, he saw the street lights going out one by one. There was an old man with a long white beard and a tunic walking in the middle of the night, for some reason, this old man was stealing the street lights. It was strange to see the lights flying from the street lights into the hands of the old man. Half of the viewers were dumbfounded, especially Gwen and Emma. Alan, for his part, felt a drop of sweat run down his cheek as he recognized the old man immediately. System, can you tell me where I am? Privet Drive, Little Winjing, Surrey. United Kingdom. Equals equals equals. Emma, Harry Potter. Gwen, it's Harry Potter. Nikki, oh my god, it's Harry Potter. Equals equals equals. That's right, I'm in the world of Harry Potter, and that old man is Albus Dumbledore. Chapter 203 Harry Potter, The Strongest Wizard Albus Dumbledore and the Boy Who Lived. This is the iconic opening scene of one of the biggest film franchises in history, Harry Potter. Alan watched the old man stealing the streetlights glow, and despite holding back, he couldn't help but comment. Why does he do that I mean, it gives the old man a mystical and magical touch, but it doesn't seem to make any sense. Rick, obviously, it's a stupid way to show that you're a wizard without explicitly saying you are one. Burp this way, the dumb generations of the early 2000s could sigh in awe and not just see a grungy old man walking. Nikki, 
my grandpa has been collecting bottle caps for a long time, maybe it's his hobby 3. Emma, of course, I understand the cinematic concept behind it, but doing it in reality looks weird. By the way, I'm glad you're okay, honey. Ruby, how shameless, and she did it in this chat. Degree degree. Felicia, it seems that Her Majesty's approval gave the girl some confidence. Rogue, what does that mean Felicia, who knows? Dumbledore stopped stealing the streetlight's glow, and his attention shifted to a striped cat that was watching him. I should have known you'd be here. Professor McConagall, said the old man. Albus greeted a cat, who soon turned into a middle-aged woman dressed in classic witch attire with a pointed hat and robe, wearing her distinctive glasses. Everyone in the chat was surprised to see her because, unlike her appearance in the film adaptation, she looked younger, enough to be considered a MILF. I can feel the malice of this world enveloping me. Murmured Alan warily. Alan felt that evil hand pushing him into romantic troubles and improving the quality of the wafers around him was working overtime, but there were limits. No matter how much the universe tried to make Minerva look like a mature and attractive woman, Alan had engraved in his memories the kind and respectable Minerva McGonagall, a very powerful and talented witch with a variety of magical abilities who ended up being like a loving grandmother to everyone by the end of the saga. So, he wouldn't lay a hand on her. You're a Hera, oh my I just saw something interesting ha 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 I'm sure you're you a key san will get jealous knowing there's a way to transform with clothes on. Emp Dragon, if I were you, I'd be careful mentioning any women here. You're a Hera. Why Emp Dragon, never mind. Hat. Emma, definitely, that world isn't the same as when I was young. Maybe she used a youth potion, I don't know ha ha ha. Jack Black, oh shit, here we go again. People, this is a coincidence, just that. I refuse to accept a reality where all women are waifus and milfs. Wait, why am I angry? Gwen. I'm upset. Both walked down the street, having a mysterious conversation for ignorant ears, but for the majority of the spectators, it was something they already knew. Are the rumors true? Albus Minerva asked nervously. I'm afraid they are. Minerva sighed. And the little one. I've entrusted Hagrid to bring him. Minerva questioned this decision, but Albus Dumbledore assured her that he would entrust his life to Rubius Hagrid. Apart from Minerva's renewed appearance, everything seemed to be the same, even the conversation didn't differ much from the original. A flying motorcycle entered the scene with a huge man riding it, with long hair and beard, giving a terrifying appearance, but Hagrid is one of the best people in history. He carried a small bundle carefully, which he reluctantly handed over to Dumbledore. It was a baby with a scar on his forehead, the baby was Harry Potter. Are you sure about this I've watched these muggles, and they're of the worst kind? Said Minerva a little upset about this situation. They're his only family, said the old man. That doesn't make them any better, Alan sighed from a distance. Dumbledore, along with the third hookage, is one of the worst elders when it comes to raising children, they practically threw them to their fate because it was for the best. Hagrid shed a tear at this, needless to say, the giant grew fond of Harry, but due to his situation, he couldn't do anything. Before anyone suggests that I take care of the boy, I'm not going to live stream 10 years of raising a child. Some ideas crossed his mind, but they knew it was most likely that Alan would jump to the future to avoid spending a decade in this world before the story began. Alan can't raise a child because he's not a reincarnate, he's a content creator. Host, that child is a mobile fragment source like the spider but more powerful. Alan sighed, arms crossed, unsurprised. It was obvious given that the world is called Harry Potter. While Alan decided what to do, Dumbledore left the child on the porch with a letter for the Disleys. The Disleys are the muggle non-magical family with whom Harry Potter lives at the beginning of the series. They consist of Vernon Disley, his wife Petunia Disley sister of Harry's late mother, Lily Potter, and their son Dudley Disley. The Disleys are portrayed as ordinary, conservative people, and quite unpleasant. They have an evident disdain for anything related to magic and an abusive attitude towards Harry, treating him like a servant rather than a family member. It was later revealed that Petunia hated wizards because her sister Lily, being a witch received more attention and affection. The only reason they accept Harry is for the hefty pension they receive every month. Alan understands that Dumbledore is trying to hide Harry, 
but what's the need to find the worst people for it the three left while Albus looked in various directions, a little confused. Then he murmured a spell, immediately the system activated a shield. Alan is limited to using only magic, but he decides not to do so in case this old man manages to detect him. One doesn't become recognized as the most powerful wizard by being naive and a saint. After the trio left, Alan walked in front of the Disley's house. To be honest, he's not a fan like Gwen, so his knowledge isn't even too much, but he does remember the kind of people they are. Alan walked up to the door. Gwen, do not kill them Si. Felicia, you're not going to kidnap Harry Potter, are you Emma? I feel conflicted. It's one thing to see this on the set, but if it's real, then I feel wrong leaving a baby in that place D. Alan reached the door and knocked. Inside, two people were holding a baby while arguing. This is nonsense. Does your dead sister want us to raise her bastard shouted Vernon. Petunia snorted with contempt Lily my silly sister couldn't close her legs even knowing she was getting into dangerous things now she's dead and throwing her son at us. Petunia left Harry in the basket on the table. Wait it says here that we'll get paid to take care of him. Vernon let out a sigh of disbelief as he plopped down on the couch holding Dumbledore's letter. Darling it's triple your salary. Petunia opened her mouth as greed overcame her dislike for Lily and anything to do with her. Looks like having the little bastard won't be so bad. Laughed Vernon making her belly quiver. Gwen, I changed my mind. Those people are a waste of space. Outside the house, Alan listened with a vein popping on his head, they really were a very unpleasant couple. Alan smiled as everyone knew what was going to happen. Silence, murmured Alan as he used a bit of magic, then kicked the door, shattering it. Both Disleys tried to scream, but their voices didn't come out, in fact, there was no sound at all. Alan walked up to the frightened couple, looked at Harry Potter's head on the table, then at the couple, gestured for them not to scream, and then returned the sound. Who are you Vernon shouted, but Alan immediately grabbed him by the neck and lifted him. I thought it was clear that I didn't want you to speak. Declared Alan with a grim look. Both realized it wasn't a joke and got scared, then nodded quickly. Mr. and Mrs. Disley. Alan grabbed Albus's letter and read it. After a moment, he burned it in his hand and signaled both to sit down. Alan took out a parchment, and it started to write things automatically, it was a contract. Well, there's been a slight change of plans. I am Alan Walker. I am. An Auror. Petunia opened her eyes, and her fear turned into disbelief and then into annoyance. She thought Alan was a criminal, dark wizard, or death eater, yes, despite being a muggle, she learned many things about the magical world from her sister. Auros are like the police of the magical world. This made her upset, there were explicit laws to protect muggles from wizards, and the ministry took care of that. How dare you come into my dash? Sit down. Alan said as some of the nearby light bulbs exploded. Petunia fell silent and sat back down, her initial courage disappearing as she saw Alan's grim face. Vernon Disley, you're a despicable, jealous, selfish, and very stupid man. However, I believe your ambition is greater. You'll be paid a good amount of money to take care of Harry Potter, so I see no reason to mistreat him, despise him, or treat him like your servant, right? I wouldn't do that. Right. I all right, I won't. Petunia, you hate your sister for having everything you don't. I understand why you are a horrible woman, but I dislike you. However, Harry isn't at fault. Right. Yes. Both of you will take care of Harry Potter with the minimum amount of affection so that a parentless child doesn't feel abandoned. You don't need to pretend to love him, but a little appreciation is okay. Percy J, wait, why doesn't he force them to treat Harry as their master Gwen, because Harry would end up like their son Dudley or like Draco Malfoy. Emma, if characters like them are meant to dislike Harry, it's not convenient for him to be raised as if they loved him or hated him as in canon. Alan proceeded to draft a contract and then handed it to Vernon. The man wanted to consult a lawyer before signing, but Alan looked at him as if he were stupid. It doesn't work like that, you either accept it or I wipe your memory and find better parents. The Disley surrendered to Alan, and fears to the kitchen to discuss while Alan drank coffee with baby Potter. Woke up. Bobby yo. 
Alan looked at little Harry and bought him a bottle of the best milk and the best thing is that it is infinite, it is not his mother's milk but it is better than drinking from the witch. G-U-H. For some reason, the women in the harem's private chat started talking. Diana H.C., aren't you going to hold him stares longingly, wanting to be the mother of your future children. Natasha H.C., I never got to hold you in my arms because when I met you, you were already five years old, I'd like to have a baby in my arms. Stares longingly, wanting to have your baby in the future. Hippolyta, we were born from clay, so parenting with a man by our side is something unknown. Since Alan appeared, our customs and thoughts have changed she feels a need to procreate. Antiope, what are you saying, Hippolyta she falls off the chair she was sitting on. Hestia, ha ha ha. Athena, we've lived millions of years without experiencing it, aren't you curious about what being a mother is like, Hestia looks curiously. Hestia, huh? What are you saying panics? MJ, Alan will be a great father, I can assure you looks lovingly. Gwen, blushes. System, what is this? Do you like it I modified the chat so that actions, states, feelings, and desires enclosed between asterisks like Rick's actions appear. Don't worry, these details are not visible to the chat, only to you. Alan went pale seeing Diana, Hippolyta, and Natasha's desires. This caught him too off guard. Host, did you think you would never have children? I know that someday what has to happen will happen, but I'm young. Host, I know that, but who told you to get involved with mature women their way of looking at life is different from that of young girls. They don't go out with a man to flirt. They think about prospects. Alan shook his head and stepped away from the chat before calming down, it's a topic for the future. For now, he'll maintain the status quo, in the future, Alan will deal with that problem. Petunia and Vernon returned and accepted that with this, Harry Potter would have a better life, perhaps his uncles wouldn't love him as parents, but they definitely wouldn't treat him as a servant. Alan approaches Harry Potter. Alan can feel two magical sources in him, one is the soul fragment left by Voldemort, and the other is the magic that protected him from Voldemort, a mother's love. Alan sighed, it's truly different to see something on a screen than to have it within reach of your hands. Alan doesn't hate Harry Potter, he couldn't hate an innocent baby, but he also can't take care of him, he won't even be in this time for long before jumping to the future to be in the events of greater conflict where large amounts of fragments are produced. As for Voldemort, there is no hurry, he can do nothing. See you, Harry Potter. Alan headed for the exit as the broken door repaired itself as if rewinding in time. Mr. Orer. Petunia stopped Alan before he left. Yes. Will we have trouble with the magical ministry? Albus Dumbledore was doing this behind the backs of the entire magical world, to prevent dark wizards from finding Harry. No, you won't. Just take care of him until he's old enough to go to Hogwarts. Said Alan with a bored look on his face. Petunia remained silent for a moment, now that her fear had disappeared, she noticed how attractive her unwelcome guest was he was probably the most handsome man she had ever seen, albeit very young. See can I ask your name? Again, sir she said timidly. Petunia Vernon felt offended by his wife's attitude. Alan looked at the woman with surprise but agreed. I'm Alan Walker. Alan bowed to her, not for taste but for etiquette. Before the end, he came up with something to scare the pair a little more. Alan smiled and I'm the strongest aura in history. Chapter 204 Harry Potter, Diagon Alley and a visit to Ollivanders. Alan left the Disley's house after they signed the contract, which obliges them to do two things, take care of Harry Potter without mistreating him physically or mentally. It seems like an unpleasant joke that a contract is necessary for something that should be common sense. The second thing is that the contract obliges them not to disclose the existence of Alan. Alan noticed Petunia Disley's gaze, but he simply sighed and paid no attention. If he slept with every woman who found him attractive, his harem would have nine figures or more. The main problem now is deciding what to do next. Alan doesn't want to or cannot live in the normal time of this world, so the most logical thing would be to leap to the future where Harry's story begins at Hogwarts. But on the other hand, he could take advantage of it to build a reputation in the magical world. Alan put that aside and went to London, specifically to a certain very famous place. 
the spectators had certain expectations. On the way Alan exchanges credits for cash. Alan had skipped the night to avoid waiting hours to go to London. It was November 2, 1981, just the morning after Dumbledore left Harry. Alan walked the streets of this huge and ancient city. He couldn't say specifically what the difference was between the London of his world and the London of Harry Potter, but there was a kind of magical atmosphere in the air, as if a truck could appear out of nowhere at any moment while wizards fought, casting rays and fireballs. Alan shook his head. He had done a lot of absurd things, but there was something about this world that had a magical charm. Yes, he had magic and magical power, but he had never been in a world entirely based on magic. Alan arrived at a certain street as the clouds brought a cold atmosphere. The leaky cauldron. Equals equals equals. Gwen, Alan, you. She looks incredulous. MJ, I see, a wizard without a wand is very rare. She laughs while rolling on your bed. Felicia, I don't understand why they're excited, it's just a very common bar. She's in the bathtub taking a bubble bath. Rick, I'm not a fan of magic, but putting the entrance where you can buy magical alcohol appeals to me. Rick is vomiting in a trash can. Why Alan was puzzled by Rick's situation, then he remembered what. It's Rick. Alan entered the place and saw many people drinking and talking. Some glanced at him and raised an eyebrow. Alan wasn't known, he was young and very striking with his hair and eyes. More than anything, there was a mysterious aura around him. It wasn't intentional, but it was the result of his apocalyptic adventures. The eyes of wizards and witches watched him as he approached the bar. Alan didn't say anything, he simply took out a sickle and slid it across the bar. The bartender looked at the coin and indicated that he could go to the back. Behind the leaky cauldron, you can access Diagon Alley. In Harry Potter's world, the currency used by wizards and witches in the UK is the Galleon. The Galleon is a gold coin that has a considerably higher value than Muggle money. In addition to the Galleon, there are also the Sickle, worth a 17th of a Galleon, and the Canute, worth a 29th of a Galleon. These coins are used in Diagon Alley and other places in the magical world for purchases and transactions. Alan was a stranger, but showing money from the magical world was a quick way to identify himself without words and would allow him to enter Diagon Alley without any problems. M.H.C., wait, aren't you going to eat Gwen H.C., Alan, I need to try the butter beer. Alan stopped in his tracks, he was about to go to Diagon Alley, but seeing many comments about trying the food, Alan decided to sit down. He almost forgot that this was the leaky cauldron. The Leaky Cauldron sells a variety of magical products and items related to the magical world. Some of the products that can be found at the Leaky Cauldron include, magical drinks, the Leaky Cauldron is known for serving a variety of magical drinks, such as butterbeer and other special potions. Magical food, magical dishes and foods can be found at the Leaky Cauldron, such as pumpkin pie and pies of all varieties. Magical books and newspapers, customers can purchase spell books, magical instruction manuals, and magical newspapers at the Leaky Cauldron. Travel supplies, magical travel supplies, such as brooms, travel cloaks, and other essentials for wizards on the go, can also be acquired. In summary, the Leaky Cauldron is a place where wizards and witches can buy a variety of magical products and essential items for life in the magical world. The first thing he ordered was butterbeer. Here you go, sir. Alan saw the iconic drink in front of him and, with a smile, decided to taste it and feel the flavor sliding down his throat. It was very good. He thanked Emma and Gwen for convincing him to stay. Alan drank three more mugs and then bought a good amount of beer to send to Gwen through the system to share with the other girls. Unlike Alan, Gwen doesn't drink, even though she's old enough to do so, but this time, the girl went crazy and broke that rule. Of course, Tony, Hulk. Thor, Jack, and Yuri, along with an army of men, complained about the injustice, but Alan couldn't buy for everyone, so he promised to have several giveaways for them. Setting aside the topic of butterbeer, Alan tried the magical food at the place, which is magical because the roast chicken in front of Alan stood up despite being completely cooked. He grabbed a knife and struck a fighting pose. Alan grabbed the fork and accepted the challenge. In the end, it was a victory for Alan. He almost felt bad for eating such a great warrior, but his mother taught him not to waste food. 
I will remember you, great warrior, sir. Gallardo, said Alan with a tear as he ate. It's so delicious, Hestia, I still can't believe you ate the chicken. Diana, a great warrior never gave up until the end, it would be dishonorable not to eat it in his honor. Nikki, that chicken had more guts than 90% of the men in the chat. Rogue, ha 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 facts. The entrance to Diagon Alley was a brick wall that was activated by touching several places in a certain sequence. Alan needed Gwen's guidance to open it, once done, the wall opened, and Alan saw the magical world in all its splendor before him. Wizards and witches were buying and walking around, dressed in different robes and outfits. Elves, owls, and magical creatures were everywhere. There was a letter flying as if flapping its wings, books floating in the air going somewhere, colorful smoke coming out of chimneys, people appearing and disappearing, a man turned into a hummingbird, a horse turned into an old woman, there was a ceramic head insulting its owner for selling it. There was a gargoyle yawning on a roof. Potions, magical books, magical artifacts everywhere. Alan could hear the fans of his chat screaming as they wished to be there. Alan laughed and promised to buy harmless magical trinkets to give away to the spectators. Of course, his girlfriends and friends would receive direct gifts without needing to participate. Mr. Walter, from the UN, we have concerns about bringing magical gadgets into our world, even if they are apparently harmless. We cannot trust that nothing bad will happen. Like a zombie virus that ends the universe Alan shook his head. Normally, he would complain about this, but he understands that everyone is still scared because of the events of the previous world. Alan wasn't even aware of the repercussions it had in his world, but from what the girls informed him, there was high tension worldwide. It's one thing to see a foreign world in danger, but seeing a similar world have such a horrible fate made many people a bundle of nerves. Alan decided to wait until things calmed down. Alan walked among the crowd, everyone minded their own business, but the handsome young man caught the attention of more than one person. For his part, Alan saw the sign of Gringotts Bank. In that place, many secrets of the magical world are found. Unfortunately, Alan has no business there for now. Inside an establishment in Diagon Alley, there was an old man with white hair and elegant clothing carefully handling several rectangular boxes. In these boxes were the most important objects for a wizard of this world, magic wands. Made of cedar, willow, birch, oak, etc. With a dragon heart string core, phoenix feathers, unicorn hair, etc. Wands of all types, sizes, shapes, colors, materials. The older man was proud of his work, of his family's legacy. He was Garrick Olivander, the current Olivander, from Olivander's shop. If you want a wand, you must go to Olivander's, this shop boasts the title of being the best creator of magic wands in the magical world, Garrick sighed. With the years, the workload became heavier, but with faithful and proud dedication, he continued to play his role as an intermediary. He doesn't sell wands, he helps them find their destined wizards and witches. The man lowered and took out a notebook to organize his inventory. Being Olivander is a blessing and a curse, he is destined to see great wizards and witches who will go down in history. Whether for their great deeds or for the terrible things they will do. Like his father before him, he handed a wand to Albus Dumbledore and Gellert Grindelwald. Garrick handed his wand to Tom Riddle. The Dark Lord Voldemort. Garrick doesn't regret it, he can't. He doesn't see the future, although he can know which wand is for which wizard, he can't see what will happen in the future. And even if he knew what would happen, could he refuse to give a wand the man looked at the clock for some reason, today he felt different. He stopped writing, stopped doing inventory, and went to his teapot, preparing two cups of tea for no reason. Garrick walked to the counter and waited, looking at the door. Garrick Olivander is a very busy man, but today, this morning, this hour, he wished to do nothing more than stand behind the counter. Olivander doesn't see the future, but he lives in a world where the impossible is optional. Olivander feels strangely nervous but also expectant. The gears of destiny usually turn with an organic rhythm, but today they seem to resonate with a new and unexpected melody. The bell rang as the door opened. Now that I think about it, you also need a wand, right, Wednesday. Not really, but as a tradition, I wouldn't mind trying those so-called unforgivable curses. Dear, 
they have that name for a reason. It's disappointing. The conversation didn't distract Olivander, a young couple entered, as if night and day had incarnated in two people. A handsome, bright young man with an overwhelming presence that simply couldn't be ignored, and a beautiful lady wrapped in mystery and a constant sense of danger. They were too different, but strangely their conversation was harmonious and warm. It made no sense. Olivander wondered why these two entered hand in hand and were not killing each other. Alan observed the man staring at him with surprise and incredulity. He doesn't remember doing anything to deserve that expression, but perhaps Olivander felt that something was wrong with this couple. Alan thought maybe Olivander sensed the power within them or something. He originally obtained his magical power from a demon, that's true. However, after the enhancement in his confrontation with Superman, that changed, now, it's entirely his own. As for the contract with Wednesday, it grants him magical power similar to his own, albeit with the restriction that he can only use what he can handle. Both entered intending to obtain magic wands, it's not that they need them, but it would be disrespectful not to have one when coming here. Alan walked hand in hand with Wednesday. Upon reaching Olivander, he greeted him, but the old man remained attentive, observing him. Alan looked on Wednesday, who was equally confused. Olivander closed his eyes, regaining his composure. It was very rare to see a witch and a wizard get wands at this age. No, in fact, in all his life, he couldn't remember ever having to give wands to two people of this age. For a moment, he thought maybe they broke their wands and came for a replacement, but he's an Olivander, he knows that's not the case. This is the first time both have come for wands. Olivander looked at the couple and noticed that their relationship seemed close. They seemed to be lovers, which was a tragedy. For some reason, Olivander felt that sooner or later the pair of lovers would be pitted against each other. If Alan were to hear Olivander's thoughts, he would fall to the ground laughing, but it was true that only superficially, they did not seem to be compatible. Chapter 205 Harry Potter, Choosing Wands, The Future of a Wizard and a Witch and Ten Years Olivander remained still, observing the couple closely. Regardless of their identity, it was his duty and obligation to match them with their wands. At this moment, two situations occurred that had never happened to him before. The first was the girl, Olivander couldn't believe what he saw. He grabbed a wand and handed it to her. Wednesday looked at the wand made of cedar with a dragon heart string core and held it. The wind entered the shop as the wand seemed to merge with Wednesday's aura. Perfect compatibility Olivander hurried with another wand, this time it was made of mahogany with unicorn hair. Wait, can you hold this one too? Olivander's actions did not seem logical as Wednesday already had a wand, however, Alan did not interrupt him. Wednesday looked at the wand and set the other one on the counter. As she held it between her delicate fingers, a bell-like sound rang out, and a mysterious force enveloped her. Perfect compatibility. Again. Exclaimed Olivander. At this moment, Alan realized what was happening, so he took two wands at random and handed them to Wednesday. What she blinked. I'm just curious, Alan replied with a wink. Again, a phenomenon occurred, she was compatible with multiple wands. No, she could use any wand as if it were her own. Olivander retreated to the wall as if he had seen the ghosts of his ancestors. He couldn't believe it. Every wand he handed over was compatible, but that made no sense, otherwise, which wand would belong to his next customer Alan sighed, understanding the reason. In his world, there are two legends related to Rosen Maiden. The first one tells of a craftsman obsessed with creating the perfect doll. His goal was to create the perfect woman, a desire, an illusion, a madness that drove him to the limit to achieve it. He didn't succeed and tragically died. The second legend speaks of a craftsman who lost his daughter. He was so sad and desolate that he decided to recreate her in a doll. He tried and tried, but no matter what he did, his dolls were just that, dolls. Rosen fell into despair, realizing that a doll could not be a person, something was missing, and he was unable to provide it. Alan looked on Wednesday. Of course, the Rosen Maiden Company was inspired by the legend for its name, or so the website description said, but honestly, it seems more like a marketing ploy because, in the end, they sell sex dolls, not artisan dolls. However, 
if indeed the bodies of the girls are attempts to create the perfect woman, they would be superior to the normal. In that sense, it is normal for her to have perfect compatibility with any wand. In the eyes of the wands, Wednesday must be a superior form of a woman, perhaps like a high elf in video games, a high human. Wednesday frowned as she looked at the wands. She could choose any, but it was precisely because of that that she couldn't choose. Alan approached and extended his hand to the man sitting on the floor. While she chooses one, how about helping me choose, Mr. Olivander? Seeing Alan's half-smile, Olivander snapped out of his daze. This was an unusual fact that would catch the attention of the entire magical world, but Garrick Ollivander's role was different. I apologize, sir. I am Alan Walker. Mr. Walker. Ollivander dusted himself off and regained his composure as a professional. He looked at Alan and sighed with relief. There was something mysterious about Alan, but unlike the girl, he could feel a specific destiny, a line guiding his hand. Ollivander's attention was completely focused on Alan, he could not show contempt to any customer, even if he had to keep Merlin himself waiting. Yes. Interesting. Power. Talent. Nobility. Destiny. Ollivander murmured, running through all the wands. Gilgamesh, first impressions were not good but this old man is a craftsman at the peak of his field. The Emperor, you can see the huge heritage and total dedication to his task. He is someone acceptable. Ollivander took a ladder and climbed up, retrieving an old wand, and showed it to Alan. It was a white wand emitting a frosty aura. Ollivander smiled, something unusual. This is a wand with phoenix feather core and not just anyone an ice phoenix. They became extinct long ago. There had been no one compatible due to the high standards of nobility required according to legends. Alan looked curiously at the wand, it seemed to whisper something. Alan reached out to touch it, and as he did, everyone expected a magical event, but instead, cracks appeared in the wand. Huh. Alan quickly put it back in the box and looked at Ollivander with a sweat drop falling from his forehead. I think I'm not compatible, said Alan with a poker face. Impossible. Ollivander lost his composure again, this time turning pale. It wasn't just that Alan wasn't compatible, but the wand couldn't withstand Alan's magical power. Of course, Ollivander realized that immediately. He looked at Alan and hurried to the back of his shop, opening a safe where there was a wrapped case, and brought it to Alan. This is a Pegasus heart wand from before they were declared endangered and hunting them was banned. I would get into trouble if word got out. Alan noticed the gravity of what Ollivander was doing for him and didn't waste his trust. This time, Alan contained his magic to the limit. When he took it, it felt very comfortable which made both Alan and Ollivander smile. However. Crack. The wand shattered into a thousand pieces before both men's eyes. Alan nodded apologetically and used Reparo to restore the wand. This made Ollivander's eyes fixate on Alan, he could use magic without a wand, and not just any magic, but advanced magic. Ollivander looked down as he mentally prepared himself, then bowed to Alan. Mr. Walker, you may come with me. Alan was confused but decided to accept. Wednesday didn't choose between two wands, and Alan decided to buy both. Ollivander didn't object. Alan didn't understand how, but he ended up at Gringotts Bank, facing a grumpy goblin, upon seeing Ollivander, his attitude improved considerably, showing how important the Ollivanders were. Goblins in the world of Harry Potter are a magical race of humanoid beings of small stature characterized by their rough skin, pointed noses, and pointed ears. Goblins are known for their ability and knowledge to craft magical objects, especially in the financial realm. They are the guardians and managers of Gringotts Bank, the most important magical bank in the wizarding world, and are responsible for protecting and managing the accounts and treasures of the bank's clients. Goblins have a distinctive culture and society, with a strong emphasis on fairness and justice. They have a very strict view of property and contracts, and it is considered a serious insult for a goblin if someone tries to cheat them in a deal or business. Although goblins are useful allies in the magical world, they can also be distrustful and resentful towards wizards and witches due to the history of oppression and discrimination by the magical community. Mr. Ollivander, I suppose you need a withdrawal. Said the goblin in a raspy voice. Not this time. 
Ollivander took out a key, the goblin's eyes widened, and he got off his desk. Follow me. The goblin discreetly glanced at Alan and Wednesday but said nothing. Alan helped Wednesday onto the strange vehicle that takes people through ancient caves plagued with powerful anti-theft barriers and protectors. Nikki, it looks like a roller coaster, shocked, random, haha, it looks fun. LMAO. Gwen, I wonder what Ollivander is thinking Emma, most likely, he has some hidden magical wand. The world was created very well, to the point that there are countless mysteries left unresolved. With the existence of the Deathly Hallows, it was confirmed that there are unknown entities beyond human understanding. Who knows what mysteries he might be hiding that's true. Upon seeing Emma's comment, Alan changed his way of thinking. He can't let his guard down hoping that just by knowing the canon he can know everything, an example is the Vault of Gringotts, there are hundreds of them but in the whole story only a few are shown, who knows what they keep. The journey is taking quite a while, commented Wednesday. Yes, I apologize, the older vault is in the deeper parts. Especially number 5 replied the goblin, causing both Alan and Wednesday to widen their eyes. Ollivander, who had been silent for quite some time, began to speak. My family has made high-quality wands for many generations, he said nostalgically. However, we were not the only ones, nor the best from the beginning. Like alchemy, science, medicine, and magic itself, everything started with the basics, and so were magical wands, testing materials, making mistakes, and attempting all kinds of objects to be the core. Currently, wands have three common types of cores, dragon heart string, unicorn hair, phoenix feathers. There have been times when common materials for wands were different or scarce, and other things were used. Once, one of my ancestors tried to create the most powerful wand. He used wood from the world tree as material. I don't know if it's true. As a core the use of a meteorite fragment that fell to earth under unique conditions. Sounds impossible. Said Wednesday, then she thought about the world they were in, there are elves, although they are not like those from the Lord of the Rings, or any ice guy. Perhaps the world tree also existed. Alan, on the other hand, remain silent. Host, there is a huge concentration of energy ahead. I know, I didn't believe it either. When that wand was created, it didn't react, it didn't even seem to have the slightest magical breath, Ollivander stopped his words as they entered chamber number 5. Gwen, a digit. Ollivander advanced and opened the vault, the goblin did not enter. Wednesday looked at Alan, waiting for his response. To be honest, Alan didn't want a super wand like the Elder Wand, it was simply a means to do magic in this world, but it would be rude to ignore Garrick Ollivander's goodwill. Alan moved forward with Wednesday, following Ollivander. In the middle of chamber number 5 was a box covered by a tattered cloth. Do you mind if I take a look? Makama appeared next to Alan, surprising Ollivander, but Alan reassured him. She is a summoning, so to speak. Alan looked at Makama with a furrowed brow, and she transformed into a mini version of herself. Mr. Walker, it's amazing that you don't have a wand even at this point. Alan quickly thought of an excuse, I have traveled through different magical cultures, but unfortunately, every time I tried to get my wand, it would break or explode. I understand. That's why you decided to practice wandless magic. I can't imagine how difficult it was. Haha. <laughs> yeah. It was, Alan replied without shame. Makama returned to her human form without showing any remorse or regret, her amber eyes stared at Alan. Equals equals equals. Makama gives me the chills. She can observe without interrupting, but she appears on purpose to make Alan aware of her existence while she watches him. What kind of bullying is this, Makama-san, red heart red heart red heart. But how can anyone like Makama when she's the ultimate canon event deliverer equals equals equals? Ollivander removed the cloth to reveal a simple yet elegant wooden case, it had a spell on it. Ollivander took out a wand and broke the seal. Inside was a grey wand with a simple appearance, no ornamentation, and straight. This wand didn't emit any magical attributes or mysterious aura, but Alan remained silent, observing it in a trance. After a while, he extended his hand and took it. Alan held the wand, he didn't press it or tense it, he simply held it, and surprisingly, it didn't break. Lumos. 
the tip of the wand lit up with a bright light. Alan smiled and looked at Olivander, I'll take it. Olivander's face was one of absolute disbelief. There was nothing about being the chosen one. The wand and Alan had zero compatibility. Olivander couldn't believe this, zero compatibility meant that no matter what he did, he couldn't use it, and if he tried, accidents, explosions, magic discharges, and uncontrollable spells would happen. However, something happened that Olivander couldn't believe, despite having no compatibility, the wand seemed to accept being used by Alan. Alan, for his part, was more than happy to find a wand strong enough to withstand his magical power without breaking. He didn't care about compatibility. Urahara, this reminds me of Zaraki Sen. He went many years without knowing the name of his Zen Pakuto. Aizen, I see. A wand and a user with no deep connection but dependent on each other. The wand couldn't find a suitable wizard, solo doomed to pass into eternity without a bearer, so it accepted the first one who could use it. Olivander never expected what kind of future awaited this pair, a woman compatible with all wands and a man too powerful to use a wand. In the blink of an eye, ten years passed, but it was only a week for Alan, he had been doing long live streams, but he only showed some things. He did this mainly to maintain a certain degree of mystery in the lore that had been created in Harry Potter. On the other hand, he couldn't attend anything else, as for his school in Marvel, he took a leave of absence due to illness. As for his job in Arkham, he had to reveal his situation to certain people whom he couldn't lie to anymore. Equals equals equals. IVHC, I can't believe this person is my boss Ivy pretends to be cold but is relieved, she thought you didn't care anymore, because you haven't visited her lately. Harley HC, that's unfair, I want to be with daddy all day too, Red Heart Harley is about to open a hole in the wall with the rocket launcher. Raven HC, she's embarrassed. Starfire HC, Raven says she wants to go to that magical world, but she's too shy to ask Raven went into her room and attacked her. Donna HC, don't worry, master, I'll be here if you need me she's on your bed in the mansion doing something. Barbara HC, she doesn't know what to say, she's happy but angry to know that you weren't a real villain, and she wants an explanation. Kara, Kara is too embarrassed to know the truth. Alan sat on a sofa while looking at the comments, this new function of the system is too useful, but it makes him question whether it's right to violate their privacy. Good morning, Professor Walker, a beautiful woman in a robe with pronounced curves approached Alan, he would swear that this woman was not aware of how provocative it was to see her curves under her robe. Alan stood up, took her hand, and kissed it like a gentleman. She blushed and looked at Alan's face. The man who didn't seem to age no matter how much time passed. Good morning, Professor McGonagall she added, regaining her composure. Haha, that's quite flattering, but we should get going, you wouldn't want to be late for your first day as a professor at Hogwarts. That's right. Alan smiled and linked his arm with the woman's. They both walked to the Hogwarts Express. Chapter 206 Harry Potter, The Walker Family and the Strongest Aura in History had appeared in the world. Alan had not yet started the stream, so viewers couldn't see Alan arm in arm with Minerva. Alan and Minerva walked through the Hogwarts Express corridors, filled with senior students, many of whom had astonished looks, unable to believe what they were seeing. Hey, the rumor was true. No way, why is he here? Minerva McGonagall chuckled, showing her white teeth and a mischievous gaze. It seems the students are in shock to see you here, Professor Walker, she said as she approached Alan. In response, Alan returned the smile and the flirtation. I do not doubt that most of the looks are envious of having such a beautiful woman close to me. Minerva's smile widened with a slight blush. You're quite good, Mr. Walker. I suppose the rumors of you being a heartbreaker are true. Alan narrowed his eyes slightly at her. If you'd like to find out, we can have dinner sometime, Alan said in a tempting tone, causing Minerva to avert her gaze. It's somewhat inappropriate for two Hogwarts professors, Minerva stammered, searching for an excuse. He he, it's a shame, Alan didn't continue the flirtation and looked at the students who were peeking out of their train cabins with amusement. I'm sure Dumbledore would have wanted to hide my arrival until the entrance ceremony in the Great Hall, but due to recent events, it's better if I'm on the Hogwarts Express. Minerva tensed at hearing that, recent events had shaken the magical world. 
She glanced sideways at Alan, realizing that this man, who appeared to be just a young man and never aged, was at the center of the storm. She sensed that dark times were approaching. They had all had a decade of peace since Voldemort disappeared, and it was rumored that he was dead, but now everything was starting again. Perhaps it was destined that the world would experience the rise of such tragedies every so often. Alan reached a private train cabin and entered, but Minerva didn't follow. She stood at the entrance with an uncomfortable look. I'll accompany you this far, Professor Walker, Minerva said with a slight reluctance to leave. However, her mission was to judge the character of Alan, the new professor, but she ended up getting involved with Alan more than she should. This man is very dangerous, the woman thought. As one of the most prominent witches in the magical world, she devoted her life to magic and had no interest in romantic relationships, yet the young man in front of her broke through all her defenses in a matter of hours and almost trapped her. It's a shame that I can't enjoy more of your company, Alan responded with a slight smile. He approached Minerva and, standing in front of her, took her soft, delicate hands. I hope it won't be the last time you allow me to be this close, Minerva. Minerva blushed and coughed as she averted her eyes from Alan. Yes, it's a shame, see you at Hogwarts. The woman disappeared from Alan's sight, or rather, she fled. Alan remained silent for a moment, then chuckled with amusement and sat down. He closed the door with a wave of his hand and erected a magical barrier. Artoria appeared in the compartment and said nothing as she sat opposite Alan, watching him. Well, it's time to start, Alan nodded towards Artoria. She would stay in the compartment while Alan carried out his plan. He stood up, his expression serious, drew his wand, and began to transform. Mutatio etatus. Alan said. Alan's body lost weight, volume, and musculature, his height decreased rapidly, and his age changed, and in a short time, he returned to being an 11-year-old child. Alan created a mirror with magic and looked at himself, then nodded satisfactorily at his original spell. Even Snape had created a spell called Sectum Sempra, which made invisible cuts towards the enemy. Knowing that magic was not something definitive but something that was developed by wizards and witches throughout history, Alan decided to develop his own spells in this world. One of them was Mutatio Etatus, which means age change in Latin. Alan smiled satisfactorily, this was not a disguise, he had literally changed his age. Of course, this spell has its limits, otherwise, it would make wizards and witches immortal, and in this world, immortality is not easy to obtain. The limit, or rather the condition to maintain the age at which the spell changes you, is to constantly consume a determined amount of magic. For someone with little magical capacity, this spell is almost impossible to maintain, but Alan can maintain the spell 24 hours a day. But the real question is why did Alan become a child? Alan decided to attack on two fronts, on the one hand, he would enter Hogwarts as a new professor to have authority and influence, and on the other hand, he would also enter as a student while the system forges fragments of destiny constantly being close to the main events. It seems my spell is very stable. How do I look? Artoria Allen asked with a slight feigned arrogance. When he didn't hear a response, he turned to see Artoria standing in front of him. She had an intense look as she gazed at him, her breath strange, and her face slightly flushed. Alan hadn't seen Artoria with that expression before, and he felt strange. Artoria I don't know what you're thinking, but stop it. Alan, being considerably smaller, felt in danger and backed away. Artoria, for her part, smiled sweetly. Era era come with Oni-chan, Alan. What? Inside the soundproof cabin, Alan remembered experiences with some ladies who considered him adorable to the point of kidnapping him. More than once. Alan broke free from Artoria's embrace, who treated him like a puppy and used a portal from the system to go to Diagon Alley, waiting for Harry Potter to arrive. Years had passed, and he hoped Harry's life wasn't as miserable as it should have been. Why did Alan help Harry? The quick answer is simple empathy, as an orphan, he also knows what it's like to live without your parents. Despite Natasha being by his side, it's not as if he would simply forget his biological mother and father. Alan simply has a weakness for a situation similar to his own, no, it was worse because he had someone who loved him more than anything in the world, and Harry was a servant at best. Alan didn't have to wait long for Harry to appear with Hagrid. 
As in the canon, Hagrid bought his wand from Ollivander and went to Gringotts. The Philosopher's Stone Alan watched as Hagrid left the bank, he had to take the Philosopher's Stone at Albus Dumbledore's request. Alan had changed his opinion of Albus, it was said that the whole incident with the Philosopher's Stone in the first book was planned by Dumbledore, and it made sense. Three eleven-year-old children had heart tests that were supposed to protect an object so ridiculously valuable that it could start a war. The invisibility cloak was given by Dumbledore, the flute that put Fluffy to sleep, not to mention that the tests were designed so that specifically Harry, Ron, and Hermione would pass them. Furthermore, was the most powerful old wizard so blind as not to notice that Voldemort was infiltrating right under his nose Alan clicked his tongue, after ten years, he already felt part of this world, and letting an elderly man risk the lives of three children to test Harry's heart and put him to the test was foolishness. Should I arrest him Alan shook his head, ruining the cannon in this way didn't benefit him at all. He needed to remember his priority. His world was becoming more dangerous, he needed massive amounts of destiny fragments before some beyonder appeared at his door. Alan returned and looked at the crowd at platform nine and three quarters. Originally, they were supposed to follow the cannon, but he and Wednesday ended up affecting this world on a level he hadn't imagined. Look, he has white hair. Don't you think he might be the son of... It can't be true, that father and son came to Hogwarts. Alan noticed that he quickly became the center of attention. He smiled with a bit of embarrassment. Host, is creating an identity as your own son embarrassing? If you know the answer, don't ask. Alan hid and waited a while. Alan heard an owl and saw Harry Potter with Ron Weasley enter the station. The cannon began, but he knew this time would be different because of his existence and the creation of the Walker family in this magical world. Alan Walker existed for the last ten years. Alan Walker, that unknown name, gradually grew in the magical world, leaving an indelible mark and creating his legend. The first thing Alan did after getting a wand was to find a way to make money. Exchanging credits for galleons was not a realistic method, as credits were more useful for other things. At the suggestion of the chat, Alan decided to sell some trinkets he could create with his powers people still believed he was a mutant. In reality, they were low-grade system items, either by buying them or obtaining them from the chests that had accumulated to more than 2,000. It was a brilliant idea, but what would the Ministry of Magic think if a wizard came out of nowhere and started selling magical items in large quantities in Harry Potter, everyone's magical heritage and past are highly valued, which is why people without it, such as muggle-born people, are so despised. Wednesday came up with the idea of creating a magical family that had moved from America and selling both in the magical market and the black market. Alan was reluctant because this would imply changing a lot of history, but Makama appeared to help. Having been a figure of authority and administration in his world for so long, she had good experience in starting a business, whether legal or illegal. Makama assured Alan that they would do business without affecting the world too much. Alan didn't completely trust her, but he decided to give Makama the benefit of the doubt. Wednesday also agreed, but she would be in charge, and Makama accepted without a problem. Alan, for his part, would seek to gain influence in the Ministry of Magic, perhaps becoming an Auror. This was necessary for his real plan to enter Hogwarts during canon history, either as a professor or as a student. To be a professor, one needs the full trust of the Hogwarts staff and essentially Dumbledore's approval. Alan had no background to back up his goodwill, that's why he thought about becoming an Auror. Nothing proves that you're not a Death Eater better than hunting Death Eaters, and the idea of a magical family didn't sound right. The Walker family was born with Alan as a young heir who had to flee his country because a very powerful dark wizard almost destroyed them. Wednesday would be his wife, although both looked like young people no older than 20, their magical power and quick witness quickly silenced the annoying voices of the closed and CLASist magical society. Wednesday, with the help of Makama and his death, delved into the dark side of the magical world, spreading their threads. Esteth was mainly there to watch over Makama. Alan, with Rebecca, and Artoria, went on the light side. Alan decided to become an Auror for a while before entering Hogwarts as a professor. Rebecca and Artoria had the role of loyal vassals and were sometimes maids. There was a rumor that they were Alan's lovers. Alan's path was very complicated because to be an Auror, he needed to be recruited, and for that, he had to excel at Hogwarts. As a result, 
he entered Hogwarts. There were many taunts because wizards usually enter at 11 years old, and Alan was already 18, however, he showed extensive knowledge of magic that impressed Dumbledore, so he entered directly into the fourth year. Alan crossed Hogwarts as an absolute genius, with top grades in all subjects and breaking a lot of records. Quickly, the taunts about his age and disdain for his origin quieted down. There was no way to fail because he had many people knowledgeable about Harry Potter in his chat, Gwen, Emma, and even J.K. Rowling herself. It was a surprise to see the author of Harry Potter in the chat. He felt this was as unfair as having Albert Einstein help you take a math test. However, the surprise was mutual because she didn't know many things about the world she wrote about. This made sense, in a couple of literary sagas, it was impossible to talk about everything that could exist in a world as large as Harry Potter, assuming that its existence is a complete world with billions of years since its existence. Discovering the contents of several vaults in Gringotts was just the tip of the iceberg, the author's jaw dropped at seeing Alan's wand, but after thinking for a while, she realized it made sense. Elves have magic even more powerful than humans on average, the world tree is simply linked to all fictional elven legends. Alan ended up skipping grades at Hogwarts thanks to help, the system, and his talent. In two years, he graduated with honors, surpassing Dumbledore's record. Some called him the next great wizard of the era. To the surprise of many in the magical world and a bit of disappointment from Dumbledore, Alan became an Auror after graduating. He didn't broadcast this and decided to skip it to make it a surprise for the chat. Alan entered the Auror Academy and graduated in a year despite needing three. Soon, rumors spread, that a monster had been born among the Aurors. The Walker family and the strongest Auror in history had appeared in the world of Harry Potter with force. Chapter 207 Harry Potter, Inside the Hogwarts Express and Alan is in danger from dangerous women. Minerva was interested in Alan, but her initial goal was to find out what Alan was up to. As for the question of why it seemed like they had just met when Alan was supposed to have attended Hogwarts before, the answer is more boring than they think. Alan's goal was solely to graduate, as a result, he did everything possible to excel in everything, he didn't intend to spend years at Hogwarts before the canon even began. Consequently, he skipped many classes, as ridiculous as it may seem to some classes he would only show up for final exams, and Dumbledore himself administered his corresponding tests. As a result, half of the teachers couldn't even see him during his time at Hogwarts. Alan was worse than a ghost, he would finish an exam and immediately jump ahead in time. He didn't participate in events, contests, or meetings, and he didn't even live in Slytherin, the house he was sorted into during his first year at Hogwarts. It's no wonder Minerva and many other teachers suspected Alan, even Dumbledore, having had bad experiences with Grindelwald and Voldemort, suspected his intentions. On the other hand, his relationship with the Ministry was also not good, Many times Alan disobeyed the Ministry of Magic and acted on his own, earning him animosity from many people. Alan Walker, a suspicious wizard with great power who irregularly and uniquely attended Hogwarts, graduated with top grades but amid mysteries and suspicions. Some say Dumbledore graduated him earlier to get rid of Alan Walker. After that, Alan joined the Ministry of Magic as an Auror. His power allowed him to complete missions that would not have been possible solo, he captured and imprisoned hundreds of Dark Wizards and a dozen of Voldemort's Death Eaters. He resolved crises and prevented a war between two families. He destroyed an entire family of wizards for practicing forbidden magic, hunted down a large number of dangerous magical creatures, and dismantled several organizations selling magical creatures. In the eyes of the people, Alan held a very peculiar position, some admired him for his achievements, and those who despised him. Additionally, there was a major incident involving the Walker family that put them in a delicate position. Basically, the Walker family is quicksand and a deep swamp at this moment, so both Alan as a professor and Alan as a student will have an uncomfortable position wherever they go. The only reason Alan is not attacked or expelled from the magical community and his house destroyed is because of his power, no matter how much they suspect and dislike Alan, that doesn't change the fact that he is a monster on PAR with Albus Dumbledore, and no one wants to provoke him without reason. Alan opened his eyes and stopped remembering for now. Hmm. Alan noticed the intrusive gaze of a light brown haired girl who seemed to want to talk to him but ended up fleeing. While he was curious about her, a part of him knew he had to be careful with the FBI. Host, 
I urge you to wait for them to grow up before. Do you think I'm a degenerate? Alan thought with annoyance. Alan sighed and decided to act quite approachable and friendly, but without being too attached to others. Well, he could greet the girl and get along to avoid being rude. Besides, unlike his father, that is, his identity as a professor, Alan as a child would have a normal journey through Hogwarts. Host, before you introduce yourself to her, are you sure you want to use your normal name? Of course, I thought about it, but it would be a hassle to have another name, so I'll just use my name with a variation indicating succession. Alan couldn't imagine what it would be like to use two names at the same time since his viewers would call him Alan, and it would be weird if he had another name at the same time. Luckily, it's not necessary to rack his brain over that. Alan thought about introducing himself as either Alan Walker Jr. or Alan Walker II, perhaps as Alan Walker II, but in the end, he decided on Alan W. Walker, that would be the name he would use when introducing himself. Alan glanced at his watch and felt it was time, he started the stream and greeted his viewers. Although for him it had been quite some time at DC and Marvel it has only been a week. Alan smiled as people entered the stream. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to explain what's going to happen. After a summary, the chat exploded with questions, especially about how the heck Alan managed to become a professor. However, Alan remained silent about that, instead focusing on the different reactions from many women. Gwen, few, I've seen photos, but the impact on maternal instincts is worse than I thought Red Heart she hugs herself, restraining her impulses. MJ, what's this inexplicable feeling of wanting to hug something Black Heart MJ? It's better not to appear with that appearance in front of her. Felicia, cute. Felicia reconsidered not hating kids for the first time. Natasha, it's happening again. Natasha remembered the days when she had to protect you from older women as if you were the president. Diana, Alan, you're adorable, although I understand why you don't like it, ha ha ha. Diana is proud for some reason. Emma Frost, I wonder if our children will take after their father, I hope so. Her mind filled with fantasies of her being pregnant. Nikki, aw cap, I know it's rude, but I'd like to hug you for a while, maybe a few days. She rolls with anxiety. Rogue, I'm not a fan of kids. But I wouldn't mind being your older sister. Ruby, faints with an enamored smile. Maria Hill, she kneels, feeling that enduring torture would be easier than resisting the urge to run to find you and shower you with affection. Ivy, in shock. Harleen, I see, even from a young age, it was clear he would be a lady killer. She's calm, but Harley is out of control in her mind. Raven, it's terrifying to think that this guy could exist. She pulls her hood down, hiding her red face. Kara, isn't it too unfair how am I supposed to punch him if his childhood appearance will be ingrained in my memories she punches a specially designed punching bag with frustration while her cheeks turn red. Barbara, don't overreact, he's cute, but not to the point of madness. She is using Batman's supercomputer to record the stream in detail. Starfire, oh, according to my people's standards, you would be discarded for being so weak. But I feel like protecting you. Starfire struggles against impulses she had never felt before. Donna, faints for the same reason as Ruby. Emma Watson, Hermione doesn't stand a chance. She smiles thinking of a future where she has to face herself and explain why two versions of herself are with the same man. Megan, I hope our kids are as cute, but I prefer your older version. Artemis Goddess, he's very cute, indeed. Artemis Bonami doll, I also prefer your older version that can hug me. She squeals like a little girl. Hestia, Hestia is looking for a way to escape from Olympus to go and hug you. Athena, she runs towards Hestia to prevent her from doing something stupid. Aphrodite, Aphrodite. Should be arrested for what she's doing. Hippolyta, if male children were like you, Themyscira would never have been an exclusive place for women. She sips wine while ignoring her maternal instincts, she fails. Antiope, she trains with her sword to ignore the fact that for the first time, she wants to be a mother. Tearju, please everyone calm down Alan is illegal right now. Is he she doubts if her thoughts are correct, but common sense says Alan is legal. Alan was speechless at the women's reaction in his chat, he knew that compared to other children, 
he had more points of being adorable, something that always displeased him because he wanted to be a muscular macho, but seeing such a reaction left him in shock. Host. I just realized you have a lot of women. Alan shook his head, coming out of the daze. No, wait, most of them don't have a romantic relationship with me. Alan searched for excuses, but he realized that even if there wasn't a romantic relationship with many of them, it wasn't ruled out that there might be in the future. Moreover, Alan regretted that on this specific day, all the women who had a relationship with him were available to be on the stream. The truth is that the last week, the streams had been simple and short. Alan avoided showing too much of his life in Harry Potter to avoid killing the magic of mystery, after all, his task is not simply to show the world but to make the whole experience fun or impressive for his viewers. The basis of creating content is to make sure whoever watches your content is satisfied. Setting this aside, he felt a slight poke in his side followed by an apology, turning around, he found an embarrassed Harry Potter for accidentally hitting him while passing by. I'm sorry. The boy with short black hair, round glasses, and a scar on his forehead apologized. Don't worry, accidents happen to everyone, Alan smiled at Harry. He had forgotten to pay attention to him after focusing on his chat, but unexpectedly, he had come. Why you re? Ronald Weasley, a red-haired boy with freckles, stuttered as he pointed at Alan with his mouth agape. Harry was stunned, not knowing what to say. Being a relatively solitary child, he lacked developed social skills. I'm Alan W. Walker. Alan interrupted the awkwardness by extending his hand. Ah, sorry. I'm Harry Potter, Harry trembled nervously but managed to shake Alan's hand. He's... He's not a bad guy, excuse him. I'm Ronald Weasley, but you can call me Ron, Ron greeted, ignoring the discomfort. Harry was stunned to see Alan, his hair and eye color were very peculiar. Alan was so striking that he could place him in a crowded place without any trouble. Harry felt that just by standing in front of him, they could get along without any problems, but at the same time, there was an invisible pressure in his presence. Harry wouldn't know why he felt that way until later. Host, it seems like you're already starting to generate fragments, it's quite interesting because nothing significant has happened yet. Alan nodded internally. After a brief greeting, he was about to leave because he had no intention of intervening in the trio of friends who were about to meet. His goal was to watch closely while spending time playing with magic. Of course, that was only for his identity as a student, as a professor, Alan had a thousand worries and things to do, including dealing with Voldemort. Well, Harry, it was a pleasure, said Alan with a half smile before turning around and walking into the train. Wait, Harry called out to Alan before he left. Alan stopped, puzzled. What's up? How about we go together? Ron's jaw dropped at Harry's words. He wanted to warn Harry not to get involved with Alan, but it was too late. Huh. Alan sat with Harry and Ron at the front. He felt reluctant, he didn't want to change anything, but now he was where he shouldn't be. Alan heard the laughter from his chat and simply shrugged, deciding it didn't matter. This is my pet, his name is Scabbers, Ron tried to lighten the mood by introducing his pet, a huge rat. Alan chuckled slightly, looking at the rat which seemed scared. Ron tried to calm his rat, which seemed to want to run away. Listen, animals without castration are more hyperactive, Alan's words sent chills down Scavers' spine. Alan shook his head, Scavers was lucky for now, they had no intention of capturing him. Alan looked at Harry who had a strained smile. You don't have to pressure yourself. Harry looked up at Alan, not knowing what he meant. I can see what happened. Suddenly you found out your parents were wizards and that a fantastic world existed, but now everyone treats you like a celebrity for an achievement you do not know of. Harry opened his eyes wide as Alan's smile made him feel sorry for himself, every word was true. He was happy to know that magic was real, but he felt very uncomfortable when people treated him like the messiah without having done anything to deserve it. That's not true Harry managed to survive he who must not be named. Ron intervened thinking Alan was belittling Harry. Harry knew Ron meant well, but this put him in a difficult position. He didn't want to snap at his new friend, but he also didn't want to stay silent and let Ron accuse Alan of just being kind. Chapter 208 Harry Potter, 
clumsy and cute Hermione is torturing Emma, and the Great Hall. Alan noticed that Harry didn't know what to do and that Ron was too young and immature to understand. That happened when he was a baby, Harry didn't have self-awareness, Alan looked at Harry. From Harry's perspective, he's in a completely new world, being the center of attention. That's stressful, isn't it, Ronald Wesley? Ron sat without being able to argue against it, then turned to Harry, realizing he was pressuring him, treating him like a hero or something, and apologized. Harry shook his head, accepted the apology, and smiled in gratitude to Alan. The atmosphere improved, and a woman passed by selling sweets. Ron couldn't buy it due to his family's situation, but Harry took out several galleons and bought everything on the cart. Alan sighed, the potters are famous for being great alchemists, and their potions made them a fortune. Harry, as the heir, has money to waste. Alan, on the other hand, grabbed a magical chocolate and tasted it. Tastes like dirt who's the son of a... Who makes these things? Harry and Ron laughed, and the tension between the three disappeared. Alan had a talent for dealing with children, which was extremely appreciated by the women in his chat. However, he refused to accept the reality himself. There were moments when Ron explained magical sweets to both of them, however, they were interrupted by an angry shout. Walker. A slim, blonde boy with a haughty manner looked at Alan as if he had killed his parents. Draco Malfoy. Ron exclaimed. Alan, on the other hand, completely ignored Draco, which only made the blonde angrier. Draco was tempted to draw his wand to attack Alan but refrained, looking at Ron with disdain and then at Harry. Harry Potter, people like us shouldn't be with this riffraff. Draco said insidiously but courteously to Harry. At the same time, Draco sought a reaction from Alan, but he continued to ignore him. What do you mean Ron got upset and stood up from his seat? What I said, that hair. That face. You're just a poor Wesley. Ron sat back down after being scolded. Harry, seeing his friends attacked, summoned the courage to confront Draco. I don't know who you are, but I won't let you insult us like that. Draco looked a bit offended at Harry but introduced himself. I'm Draco Malfoy from the prestigious pureblood family, the Malfoys. I heard that Harry Potter had appeared after ten years, and as a fellow pureblood, I decided you were worthy of a friend. Draco smiled and offered his hand once he introduced himself, expecting Harry to understand who he should be with. I don't know what a pureblood is, but you're not very nice, Harry responded without shaking his hand. No matter how important Draco was, Harry valued sincerity more than social status. Alan smirked inwardly. Draco was already upset by Alan's presence, and Harry's daring to challenge him only made him angrier, and seeing Alan's mocking smile pushed him over the edge. I thought I could honor you with a friendly relationship, Harry Potter. Draco looked at Alan with disdain and then at Harry. But I see you chose the traitor and a Wesley over a pure blood. Alan snorted. All the interaction between Harry and Draco was different from how it should have been, and they ended up meeting on the train rather than before the sorting ceremony. This was clearly due to his existence, but everything ended with a lasting enmity between Harry and Malfoy as it should have been. Harry looked at Alan upon hearing himself called a traitor. Alan blinked at the tension and chuckled with a mixture of mockery. Don't worry about it, Harry, he's just mad because my father put him in Azkaban, Alan smiled at Malfoy's furious look. As for calling me a traitor, it's because my father was a Slytherin like them. Ron choked on a candy upon hearing that information, he didn't expect Alan to address the issue so casually. Draco's lackeys got nervous knowing that was a sensitive topic, and Draco turned red with anger, looking like he was ready to use an unforgivable curse on Alan, of course, if he knew one. Someday you and your corrupt father will pay. Draco stormed off with his lackeys, leaving the three of them behind. Alan snorted and cast a spell. Slip. Draco slipped and fell to the ground out of nowhere, feeling humiliated. He scolded his lackeys before walking away. Gwen, that was childish but satisfying. Emma Watson, I had forgotten how annoying Draco was haha, <laughs> of course, it was just acting in my case, but Tom tried to be unpleasant. In the cabin, Ron's face brightened as he saw Draco fall, and Harry laughed. This relieved the tension among them. Harry, on the other hand, 
was confused but didn't know if it was appropriate to ask. Alan looked at the curious boy who couldn't hold back and explained everything to him. No way. Harry sighed incredulously. At the same time, his animosity towards Draco grew when he learned that his father was a henchman of the monster who killed his parents. Alan's father was some kind of wizard police, and Draco's father was a pure-blood wizard who was like nobility in the magical world. However, secretly he was dark and very dangerous, serving Voldemort. Lucius Malfoy was captured by Alan's father and imprisoned in Azkaban. Harry understood that Draco's resentment towards Alan was irreconcilable. Thanks for standing up for me haha, Alan laughed, embarrassing Harry. I guess you'll be sorted into Gryffindor. Alan added, but Harry didn't understand the reason. T that's be because, Ron spoke with his mouth full of sweets, at Hogwarts, there are four houses to which you can be assigned. Gryffindor stands out because its students are naturally brave. Harry was embarrassed because he didn't believe he was someone like that. Host, it seems your plan to be a spectator won't work anymore. Yeah, Alan shrugged, that's life, you never know what's going to happen. Alan ended up with Harry in his first year. Alan stood up, saying he was going to the bathroom, to avoid interrupting Harry, Ronald, and Hermione's meeting. Alan walked out into the hallway, and unexpectedly, a frog jumped in front of him, and he made it float in front of him. This is. Alan frowned, feeling a bad feeling. Excuse me, is that frog from? Alan turned to see a girl speaking to him. It was Hermione. Unfortunately for Alan, he wanted to avoid meeting her before she met the pair. Why you? And Emmy, Hermione froze upon seeing Alan and lost the ability to speak. Shit, I changed the cannon again. Host, be careful. She's underage. You don't have to remind me. Emma Watson, oh god, this is awkward and embarrassing. From Emma's perspective in the chat, it was like seeing embarrassing photos of herself in an old album. Alan saw the girl with her mouth open and approached to hand her the frog. Don't worry, I have no intention of stealing it, Alan smiled and prepared to leave immediately. Hermione reached out and grabbed Alan's hand, putting him in a tense state. FBI. This development of events is interesting. Alan smiled, maintaining his innocence until the end. What do you need? Hermione didn't know what to say, or even understand why she had stopped Alan. She began to feel embarrassed. Alan on the other hand had a bead of sweat dripping from his forehead. He made sure that nothing that happened would land him in jail. The women's gaze in his chat felt like thorns on his back. Alan wanted to retort that he didn't seek out these situations and was just another victim. After two minutes, Alan decided that the situation was too silly, and simply thought of Hermione as another student. My name is Alan W. Walker. Hermione snapped out of her daze and introduced herself. I'm Hermione Granger. And in the future, I'll be a great witch. She immediately turned pale upon hearing her own words. Emma Watson, it's not my fault. That's how the character is. Wants someone to kill her to avoid embarrassment. Alan watched as Hermione turned pale to the point of wanting to escape. That's a coincidence, I aspire to surpass Dumbledore as a wizard, Alan said with a smile. Hermione widened her eyes, seeing no hint of mockery or disdain from him. She was touched but at the same time didn't know how to respond as everyone treated her as someone inferior to having both muggle parents. Her insecurities came out and she said something she didn't want to say to avoid embarrassment. It's impossible for you, Dumbledore is the most powerful wizard in history outside of legends like Merlin and Rasputin. Thinking of surpassing him is childish Hermione bit her tongue as she began to tremble. Alan could even see tears of frustration in her eyes. She must have thought she had ruined a possible friendship. Emma Watson, stupid girl, can't she just shut up, Alan, I swear she doesn't mean it from the heart. She's just dumb. Emma threw her keyboard against the wall after finishing typing. Alan blinked amusedly as Hermione ruined things the more she spoke. Alan didn't get angry, he understood that she had no intention of insulting him and simply gave him a sympathetic smile in response. Hermione didn't know how to apologize for her words and felt bad about denying the wish of someone who had previously shown support for her dream. Alan wasn't a child and didn't take offense at the words of a girl who had a long way to go. So he, of course, gave Hermione an out. It won't be easy, that's true, 
Alan chuckled at her. Well, we'll see, miss. By the way, it's interesting that you're helping a fellow student you just met. I thought you'd be suitable for Ravenclaw, but seeing that, I think Gryffindor will have another model student. With those words, Alan fled, leaving Hermione stunned and at a loss for words. It could have been a normal comment from Alan's point of view, but this caused her to blush and Alan turned pale, realizing he had made a mistake by getting involved with her so much. The chat brutally mocked Alan. Alan prayed that their interaction would be short enough to avoid trouble and being accused of horrible things. Alan returned to Harry and Ron, who had a questioning look as they saw him a bit pale. It's nothing, Alan said, grabbing a Tabasco sauce candy. Today wasn't his day. The rest of the trip was normal, although Alan's intervention delayed the destined meeting of the three. He didn't believe he could easily avoid the threads of fate. Upon arriving at the station, all the first-year students were called by Hagrid. The appearance and size of the half-giant made everyone sigh, except Alan and Harry. Alan felt two intense tears on his back, one from Draco and the other from Hermione. He also noticed the gaze of a girl in his direction, she had light brown hair. Alan felt like he had seen her before but couldn't remember where. Alan looked in a certain direction where a striking man was getting off the Hogwarts Express, it was Alan Walker, or rather Artoria in his appearance. To avoid suspicion, Artoria would replace him when he became a student, and Rebecca would replace him when he became a teacher. The students made a commotion with Alan's arrival, however, he just smiled and disappeared. Impossible! Hermione exclaimed. No one should be able to use apparition spells or something similar on the Hogwarts grounds. Hagrid noticed the commotion, gave Alan and Harry a nervous look, then spoke. He's a new teacher who arrived unexpectedly. Many don't know, but he has permission to do that. Hagrid lied because he didn't even know what Alan had done to bypass the powerful barriers and spells protecting Hogwarts. Everyone boarded their boats and went to the sorting ceremony where their fate would be decided. Chapter 209 Harry Potter, The Hogwarts Houses Gryffindor, Hufflepuff, Ravenclaw, and Slytherin. The trip to Hogwarts was in boats guided by Hagrid. Alan exchanged places with Artoria during their boat trip to Hogwarts. How does the exchange work well? It's simple. It requires two things, the stall's ability to appear anywhere with Alan and the system itself. For a moment, time stops, and they teleport instantly between each other. Since no magic is used in the process, it's almost impossible for anyone to find out, even Dumbledore. On the other hand, it's not just about disguising themselves as Alan. The girls have both a spiritual and physical connection with Alan due to the vitality they derive from him, which is their source of energy. So, they are practically indistinguishable from Alan, of course, ignoring his personality. Artoria acts more reserved and calm, but that won't change. She can be polite, but while disguised as Alan she will avoid prolonged contact with others. On the other hand, Rebecca is temperamental. She'll likely get Alan into trouble even if she doesn't intend to. Alan swapped places with Artoria, so she's on the boat with Ron and Harry. Since both of them are marveling at the landscapes and the enormous Hogwarts castle, they won't pay much attention to Alan. In a corridor at Hogwarts, a tall old man in a robe with a large white beard walked toward the Great Hall. The old man stopped and looked to his right. It's a pleasure to have you here, young Walker. No, I should call you Professor Walker. Good evening Professor Dumbledore Alan was leaning against the wall. Albus' tone denoted courtesy and kindness, but Alan could sense a hint of caution from him. J.K. Rowling, after what happened with Tom Riddle, Albus is very distrustful. Gwen, it's not surprising that he even plans to test Harry Potter to know his heart. Emma, it's even annoying because half of his suspicions stem from the fact that Harry was raised by relatives who didn't care, with Alan's intervention, they didn't mistreat Harry, but it doesn't change the fact that he lacked familial love. Rick, burp grandfather of the year, leaves the brat with bullies full-time and ends up suspecting him because he grew up in those circumstances. Gilgamesh, you have some nerve to say that after showing your relationship with your granddaughter. Gilgamesh looks at Rick with contempt. Professor Dumbledore, I thought it necessary to see you in person for a greeting before my presentation. Alan had a friendly attitude. While Albus Dumbledore isn't the best person in the world, he's not a villain either, he simply uses questionable methods when acting. 
Alan has no intention of antagonizing him unless Dumbledore initiates a confrontation. I understand. How about we talk as we walk to the Great Hall? I agree. Both men walked through the corridors of Hogwarts. I still regret that you didn't enjoy your time at Hogwarts. Coming here is more than learning knowledge, Hogwarts is the cradle of magic and the most important magic school in the world. I had my reasons, and I'll always be grateful that you helped me graduate, even if I press to do it as quickly as possible. Albus glanced sideways at Alan. Despite both of them suspecting each other, and their relationship being very tense, Albus was the wizard who spent the most time with Alan during his first time at Hogwarts. I know you think I'll be another Voldemort. I don't think Grindelwald is more suitable, but instead of seeking wizarding supremacy, do you think I'm on the side of muggles? I won't deny that few wizards have as much affinity, knowledge, and taste for the muggle world. I just spoke the truth, wizards underestimate what can be achieved with technology. However, it's something that future generations will take care of. I hope there won't be a war. Maybe there will be. Tony, I won't deny that in terms of destructive power, technology has a lot of potential. But things like magic that manipulate time, the mind, the soul, and even reality, no matter how far technology advances by a century, will not be easy to reproduce. One can criticize that the wizards in Harry Potter seem weak because they need to cast spells that are not as fast as bullets, but not even all the ammunition in the world can rewind time by one second, something that with magic even children can do. Professor Dumbledore, I'm not your enemy. I know. Both men fell silent until they reached the Great Hall. Alan switched places with Artoria again. The first years waited outside the Great Hall. Hey, what's up Ron looked puzzled at Alan. Did something happen asked Alan, with a hint of concern. The only unpredictable factor in this exchange method is if the girls do something that Alan himself couldn't do. It's that you seem distracted and spoke little Harry added. Of course, Artoria acted like Alan but much more reserved and serious, something that isn't strange in Alan, but considering that all the first year students are excited, it's very odd to see. I'm sorry, I didn't want to ruin the experience, but my father indeed brought me to Hogwarts a couple of times, so it didn't surprise me as much as it did you guys. Harry and Ron understood Alan's lack of enthusiasm and accepted it. There's something stinky in here. Draco said with an annoyed voice from not far away. His eyes radiated disgust at seeing Alan. Alan could ignore Draco, but if he doesn't put a stop to the brat, then it will be worse. Maybe it's you. I heard that the Death Eater scent is contagious. All the students held their breath. Lucius Malfoy being declared a Death Eater was a huge stain on the Malfoy family. If it hadn't been for Narcissa Malfoy, faced with the imminent destruction of her family, she made the difficult decision to leave her husband and blame him for everything. With her power and influence, which she could gather from both friends and family, the Blacks, she could contain the damage. As a result, only Lucius was thrown into Azkaban, and she and her son were set free. People started to suspect that it was impossible for his wife not to know that he was a Death Eater and that being the head of the Malfoy family made it impossible to disassociate him from the family. However, the unexpected testimony of a person declaring Narcissa's innocence cleared all doubts. And that person was Alan Walker. The humiliation of having the person who saves you be the same person who imprisoned your father generated a permanent hatred in Draco. Walker, if you're just the bastard son of a corrupt aura who accused and locked up innocent pure-blood wizards. That's the narrative that relatives and friends of many wizards and witches whom Alan captured to save face maintain. The only reason this lie persists is that Alan's reputation isn't the best. Whatever you say, Draco, but your father is safe in Azkaban. Harry opened his eyes, and Ron choked, Hermione due to breathing, other people would have been intimidated by Draco Malfoy's threat because of who he is, but Alan W. Walker didn't. What's worse is that he doesn't have mercy when attacking Malfoy, he's even cruel. Gwen, I know he deserves it, but he's just a kid. MJ, what are you saying, Gwen that brat deserves to be corrected from a young age so he doesn't grow like a bastard? Gwen, I'm not defending him, but it's like seeing a chihuahua barking at a pit bull, and the latter just growls back. Alan, on his part, doesn't regret what he did. He may be young, but Draco isn't stupid, he knows what he's saying, and Alan doesn't doubt that if Draco had the chance to get revenge, he would. 
Walker, mention my father again, and I swear. Are you going to accuse me to your father said Alan with a wicked half smile. Jack Black just leave it, he's already dead. D. Harley, even Lucius in Azkaban felt that ha ha ha. Percy J. Jesus Christ, remind me never to argue with Alan. D. Barbara, a kick in the balls would have hurt less lmao. Everyone watched as Draco went from red with anger to pale. If he hadn't still been standing, people would have thought he needed to be taken to the infirmary or something. The doors opened. The Great Hall in Harry Potter is an iconic place where every year begins. J.K. Rowling, the Great Hall of Hogwarts is an impressive and majestic space, the high vaults adorned with stars, the four long tables for each of the Hogwarts houses Gryffindor, Hufflepuff, Ravenclaw, and Slytherin, the raised throne for the headmaster, and the tall windows that let in natural light during the day. It is a place that evokes a sense of grandeur and tradition. Alan observed the ceiling candles with curiosity. He didn't know who made the ceiling, but they had very good taste. Emma Watson, I have bad memories of this place, it's very beautiful, but since they didn't use CGI but real candles, it was as hot as the desert. Alan chuckled at Emma's comment. In front of the new intake of students, there were many older students at their respective tables. Ron was excited, Harry nervous, and Alan completely relaxed. The looks were divided between Harry Potter and Alan Walker for different reasons. On one hand, there were looks full of admiration and amazement towards Harry. The looks towards Alan were filled with suspicion and intrigue, but also amazement at Alan's appearance. Some girls had hearts in their eyes, not literally, but they stopped seeing Alan as the Black Plague and started seeing him as the bad boy who came to school. Alan, for his part, focused his attention on the teacher's table. He saw Albus Dumbledore's gaze on him with interest, Minerva's with amazement, of course, I'm a younger version of my father, thought Alan with amusement. Severa Snape fixed his gaze on Harry as if searching for a resemblance to his parents, James Potter and Lily Potter. Alan shook his head, Snape could have been Harry's father if it weren't for his pride, which made him treat Lily poorly for being a mudblood when she defended him from James and his bully friends. He admitted that he regretted that all his life. On the other hand, a young man with white hair and silver eyes was sitting while serving himself a glass of wine, and the surprising thing was that he looked as young as a senior at Hogwarts, but he was sitting with the professors. People didn't take long to realize who he was, and the rumor that he had stopped being an Auror to be a professor at Hogwarts was confirmed. Of course, Harry and Ron noticed and looked at Alan once again only to realize that they were relatives. Ron, isn't he too young to be a father Harry whispered. They say he's immortal, no one has seen him age, said Ron as he looked indiscreetly at both Alan and the young teacher. Immortal exclaimed Harry, but Ron covered his mouth. Alan, for his part, had an ironic look as he could hear everything they were saying about him. Dumbledore stood up from his seat. Please, everyone behave yourselves. Dumbledore glanced at everyone, the sorting ceremony will take place so that the new students can sit. Minerva stood up and took the floor. When you hear your name, come up and take a seat, then the sorting hat will assign you to one of the four houses. All the new students were expectant. Come on, you can do it. Hermione murmured. Alan knew that the pressure she was feeling was greater since she didn't have the support of a magical family behind her, not even a father who was a wizard. Hermione constantly tries to prove that she is not inferior to anyone else. Alan approached from behind, don't worry. Alan said quietly to help her calm down, he had already resigned himself to not being a spectator, he's just too flashy, it's embarrassing but he's even more eye-catching than Harry Potter. Hermione turned to see Alan behind her, she almost stumbled, but Alan unconsciously caught her. FBI, Alan, as always, is a very kind man. Alan felt cold sweat on his back and wanted to step away, but Hermione hugged him. Thank you, she whispered before releasing herself. Hermione Granger. Minerva coughed and called Hermione, she went up happily and sat in the chair before the sorting hat was placed on her head. Alan, for his part, wanted to raise his hands and shout that he was innocent, but that would make him look even more suspicious, so he crossed his arms, forcing the greatest shamelessness he could muster. Grafender! shouted the hat and the Grafender table students applauded. Alan felt everyone's painful glances. Harry and Ron were confused. Some laughed, 
while others, like Malfoy, disparaged him for hugging a mood blood. The most painful glance came from Arturia, who was expressionless but reflected the sentiment of the entire chat. Draco Malfoy The young heir of Malfoy walked with a smug smile, people were whispering, but it didn't change anything he would clear his name and make everyone pay. Draco looked resentfully at Arturia at the teacher's table. However, she ignored him. Draco felt offended, but he couldn't do anything his opponent was a teacher. He sat down and they put the hat on him. Slytherin. Draco smiled with pleasure and looked arrogantly at Alan, for some reason, it was an achievement for him to be in Slytherin. Ron Weasley. Ron went up relatively nervous but ended up in Gryffindor, the Weasleys always went to Gryffindor, so his brothers weren't surprised. Harry Potter. Sighs of admiration and curiosity filled the room. Alan slapped him on the back, and Harry remembered their previous conversation. You don't have to force yourself and appear to be a savior. Harry smiled and walked with more confidence, Albus nodded in approval at seeing the actions of Alan Jr. The hat seemed to hesitate, Alan knew the reason. The connection with Voldemort made Harry capable of being in both Gryffindor and Slytherin. Harry begged not to be put in Slytherin, and the hat agreed. Gryffindor. Albus nodded approvingly, and everyone else did too, there was a belief that Harry would fit in Gryffindor a long time ago. Alan W. Walker. Minerva announced the next name, and there was silence. The looks of the other teachers turned to the young man beside her, who was Artoria in disguise. She didn't react, she simply looked at Alan with interest. Alan began to walk towards the sorting hat. Ron, Harry, and Hermione hoped that Alan would go to Gryffindor, but they were also aware that Alan's father was a Slytherin. Since a wizard's house also determines part of his character, the fact that Alan was a Slytherin the first time didn't help to diminish suspicions towards him, and now his son was about to select a house. Chapter 210 Harry Potter, The Dark Wizard Voldemort is a Latent Danger Arriving at the chair, Alan greeted Minerva, and she smiled kindly. Symbolically, Alan looked at his father, and Arturia nodded in acknowledgement, it would be strange if father and son didn't even look at each other in this situation. As Alan had the sorting hat placed on his head, the hat was stunned. What but? You are. Something unexpected happened, the hat was unable to penetrate Alan's mind and heart. This made the albino boy smile, while everyone looked at the hat, awaiting its decision. Don't think too much, hat, just put me in Gryffindor. Alan whispered. I I see. This is the second time it's happened to me. The hat murmured before raising its voice, though much weaker than in other announcements. Gryffindor. The hat didn't know how to evaluate him, yet a little known detail is that it also takes into account the student's will, so it placed Alan where he asked. The announcement received applause, albeit to a lesser extent, but his friends applauded him despite the discomfort of many present. Many girls from different houses also applauded, the boys looked at this behavior among the girls confused at first but quickly realized that despite everything Alan W. Walker as their father was poisoned to women, and this made them angry. Alan sat in an empty seat next to Hermione, Harry and Ron were in front. Alan noticed several insidious glances from the Slytherin table, but unexpectedly, they weren't from Draco and his followers. Alan earned the enmity of many pure blood wizards he captured and as everyone knows pure blood wizards usually enter Slytherin, it seems that the fact that Alan Jr. was not placed in Slytherin was the straw that broke the camel's back and many began to see him as their enemy. Alan in response to these looks simply smiled. Susan Bones. A cute girl with light reddish brown hair nervously stepped forward, Alan recognized her as the one who had been giving him looks since platform 9 and 3 quarters. Gwen, Susan Bones, a minor character who enters Hufflepuff, doesn't have much relevance until later when she demonstrates valor and loyalty in the Battle of Hogwarts. Alan nodded, but at the same time, he felt like he had met Susan before, and the surname Bones came to mind, but he couldn't remember from where. Perhaps on some mission or while dueling a Death Eater. Gryffindor. What Alan was surprised by this turn of events, he understands that his existence causes changes, but out of nowhere, a character changed houses. Not only Alan was surprised, but also the chat, as she was supposed to go to Hufflepuff. Even the author couldn't know the reason for this. Gwen, what JK Rowling, what Emma, what MJ, what's going on Kara, 
is there something surprising about her being sorted into Grafender J.K. Rowling, he he, now I realize that even the least relevant characters have their lives and stories. I don't know what happened, but she went from being Hufflepuff to Grafender. Although something tells me it has to do with our heartbreaker. Natasha. Maria H., Alan, I'm not going to have to arrest you, right I didn't do anything. I don't even remember her. Alan replied to these accusations. Susan arrived and sat next to Alan, giving him a friendly smile before proceeding to watch the rest of the ceremony. On the other hand, Hermione pinched Alan's arm jealously, making him pale and regret pretending to be a student. Daphne Greengrass The Greengrass surname caused a stir as it belonged to one of the oldest pure-blood families in England. The blonde girl stepped forward confidently, a look of arrogance and indifference on her face. However, a beautiful smile formed on her face as she politely greeted the teacher's table, specifically Alan Artoria. Alan raised an eyebrow at this from his table. Slytherin It wasn't surprising that Daphne was accepted into Slytherin. Before stepping down from the podium, she gave a disdainful look to Grafender, no, those eyes of contempt and disappointment were directed at Alan. This left him feeling confused, how could she respect and despise him at the same time his chat mocked him for that. Pansy Parkinson A girl with long black hair walked toward Minerva with a visible frown, Minerva pointed to the chair but before sitting, Pansy glared hatefully at Alan at the Grafender table. Emma, she's Draco's most fervent follower, you being his enemy makes you Pansy's enemy too. Unfortunately for her, Draco ends up with Daphne's younger sister, so she's doomed to eat dirt in the corner. Gwen, looking at Pansy. I realize one thing. Don't you think she's prettier Felicia, being jealous of a girl is childish, Gwen. Gwen, it's not that. Just look, long black hair like a jet, porcelain clear skin, bright blue eyes, she's as pretty as a doll. WTF. Alan made no comments, he watched Hermione beside him. She must have had longer teeth at the beginning of the story, but as she turned, she smiled, showing two rows of perfect teeth. Raven, no just look at the voluptuous woman with the witch's hat, she should be an old lady. God is a pervert in this world. Alan made no comments and decided that the ceiling candles deserved more attention at this moment. Dumbledore stood up and looked at everyone, first years are reminded not to go into the forbidden forest. It's forbidden. Mr. Filch, our caretaker, asked me to remind you that the third floor corridor to the right is off limits. Unless someone wants to die a horrible death. Dumbledore looked at Harry before continuing. Accomplishments will be rewarded, failures will be punished with points in both cases. Dumbledore glanced sideways at Alan. As a highlight, you may have already noticed, but this year we have a new teacher. Alan Artoria stood up, causing all eyes to focus on him. There were rumors quickly spreading, but not near Alan J.R., as it would be uncomfortable to talk about his father. Originally, because all positions were filled, Professor Walker would conduct specialized classes in each subject from time to time, his experience against dark wizards and death eaters is simply invaluable. However, since Professor Quirrell reported a delay in his return to Hogwarts, Professor Walker will take his place in defense against the dark arts classes. This announcement excited the majority, as mentioned before, Alan's reputation is terrible, his intentions are mysterious, and trust in him is low. However, there is one thing that cannot be criticized, and it is his power and abilities. The same power that allowed him to graduate in a few years from Hogwarts, breaking all standards, the same power that made him the terror of dark wizards. The same power that gave him the title of the strongest aura in history. Well, that's all, let's eat. With Dumbledore's announcement finished, a banquet appeared before everyone. Students began to indulge in the luxurious food worthy of Hogwarts beginning. Alan watched as Ron grabbed two chicken legs, he ate as if he hadn't eaten anything in a decade. Alan silently looked at the food. Equals equals equals. Hulk, Hulk hungry. Yuri, human food is always so good. Gilgamesh, mongrel, this king will consider rewarding you if you bring me food from your time. Thor, looks good, but it lacks a Scardian ale. Ivy, it's a school banquet, obviously, there won't be alcohol, straight face, Gwen, I wouldn't get too excited with this food. After all, 
some people complain about the lack of hygiene when prepared by elves. Alan also knew that the Hogwarts elves tended to tenderize meat with their feet. Alan watched Harry and Ron smiles as they stuffed their mouths with food. Ignorance is bliss, Alan shrugged. A group of ghosts began to emerge throughout the Great Hall, at first, it seemed like they wanted to scare the new students, but it quickly appeared that they were playing and laughing like a show. Harry, Ron, and Alan left the Great Hall following Prefect Percy Weasley. They reached the famous constantly changing spiral staircase. Whoa. Ron stepped forward to see the magical phenomenon. Ravenclaw this way. Another prefect said, leading a group of students downstairs. Grafender, follow me, Percy guided everyone upstairs. Not only were the spiral stairs magical, but the pictures on the walls had moving figures, some waved. Alan was surprised by these ghosts, many didn't seem to have unfinished business but were simply there for pleasure at Hogwarts. On the seventh floor, they entered a hallway leading to the Grafender Tower, the landscape of pictures with ghosts ended and at the end of the corridor, there was a large picture with an obese lady. Alan looked closely at the painting so this is the entrance to Grafender. I wonder about the others, ahem, Hermione coughed from behind Alan, and when he turned, she smiled. The entrance to Slytherin is below the lake, and to enter, you must say a password to a serpent statue. As expected of Slytherin, even their entrance is creepy, Harry commented. Hermione felt the stairs on her and continued confidently, the entrance to Ravenclaw's common room is in a high tower, it's a door with an eagle, and you must solve a riddle to enter. The answer we need is why you're in Gryffindor and not Ravenclaw on question the girl who always seemed to have an answer for everything. I could thump you on the nose and show you why. Hermione growled, then noticed Alan's gaze and continued. The entrance to Hufflepuff is peculiar. It's near the kitchen and is a beer barrel. Thor, by Odin, why didn't you enter Hufflepuff Gwen, no. No alcohol, we've had enough of that. Barbara, is Alan bad with alcohol MJ, sweetheart, you don't want to know. Percy interrupted the discussion and addressed the lady in the painting. Password, she asked. Caput Draconis. Percy said, and it opened, everyone entered with anticipation and was not disappointed. Once inside, the students were greeted by a warm and welcoming atmosphere. The stone walls were adorned with red and gold tapestries depicting the lion, Grafender's emblem. The room was lit by torches and chandeliers, providing soft light. It was furnished with comfortable sofas and armchairs, tables, and chairs for schoolwork or board games. In one corner, there was a fireplace that provided warmth and comfort during cold winter days. And of course, there were many trophies won by generations of Gryffindors adorning various shelves. Percy turned around. Boys to the left, girls to the right, going up the stairs, your belongings are already on your assigned beds. Alan entered one of the rooms he would share with Harry, Ron, Neville, a boy named Seamus, and a boy named Dean. Alan let everyone fall asleep and teleported with Artoria. He wasn't going to sleep in a room full of boys when he had his private room. In comparison to a student's room, a teacher enjoyed a private office and a large room with all the comforts, including a private bathroom. Alan appeared in the middle of the room in his normal appearance and walked through the lavishly decorated place. In the dormitory, there was a plush bed with a change of women's clothes on top, it must be Artoria's. Alan glanced towards a wooden door where running water could be heard, Artoria was taking a bath. There were perverts in the chat who commented some nonsense but were immediately banned. Ah, how boring. Rebecca appeared and flopped onto the bed, having a tantrum, she was upset because she couldn't pretend to be Alan. Sorry, Rebecca, this time it was complicated. Alan didn't want to let her down this time because he would be under Dumbledore's eyes, and although the disguise was perfect, it would be very strange if Alan acted like a troublemaker out of nowhere. Alan sat on the bed and stroked Rebecca's head to calm her. I'm sorry, I'll make it up to you. FCK. You better Rebecca smiled with pleasure, she always thought being pampered was stupid and disgusting, but since it's Alan doing it, it feels good. Hmm. After a while, Rebecca crawled on the bed with her eyes half closed and a slight blush on her cheeks. On second thought I'd like to be compensated right now, honey. Alan smiled and decided to end the stream, until tomorrow. Needless to say, he stayed in that place all night, Artoria didn't participate in anything, 
but Alan felt more than a couple of eyes watching his night with Rebecca. There was a lot of dissatisfaction in the chat, but there was nothing they could do. The scene shifted to the next morning with Alan walking through the halls of Hogwarts. Alan had to be both a teacher and a student, he would switch places with Rebecca in the less demanding classes, and in the more demanding ones, he would take himself, while teaching the defense against the dark arts classes. In his mind, Quirrell's absence occupied most of his concerns. If this world were 100% faithful to J.K. Rowling's description, then Alan could only sit and wait for events to unfold to gain fragments. However, seeing that there are differences, speaking specifically about the appearance and age of certain female characters, Quirrell's disappearance may be his fault or not, but one thing is certain, Alan can no longer trust blindly. If the opportunity arises, Alan plans to confront Quirrell. No, Voldemort. Where is Voldemort right now?